The protagonist cheerfully held a bouquet of flowers, telling us that his name is Ling. Today marks one month of dating with his girlfriend. However, what he didn't expect was that his girlfriend would break up with him on the same day. The protagonist begged her not to leave, but at that moment, a car skidded near them and stopped next to the girl. The driver wished the girl a happy birthday, as it seemed to be her day. She told the protagonist that they needed to go to an international financial center because he would take her to a luxury restaurant and buy her a gift. Looking at the protagonist, she said that to win someone like her, money was necessary, suggesting that he wasn't worthy of her. She left, leaving the protagonist wondering if he deserved it. People around wondered if the protagonist wasn't worthy of her as they looked at his birth date and the girl's beauty. However, she seemed to be materialistic, as everyone noticed. The protagonist worked part-time as a janitor at school to pursue Lou and had saved money to buy gifts for her. His classmate commented on how hard the protagonist had tried, but the rich boy won her over in a matter of days. In the end, the protagonist wondered if this happened because he was poor or just because he was a frustrated janitor. He swore not to give his heart again. At that moment, Windows appeared out of nowhere and told the protagonist that he needed to activate the divine opponent system. After activation, the system showed his statistics, including the impressive billion-dollar counterattack ability. Additionally, the system gave him a card with billions of dollars to spend as he pleased, transferring only 1% of the spending to his personal wealth. Confused, the protagonist asked if he could spend a trillion dollars as he wished, and the system confirmed it but reminded him of the counterattack limitation. With a smile, the protagonist declared that the counterattack should begin. While passing through the commercial district, he was determined to find someone to test his new power. Soon, he spotted someone who seemed to be Legion's ex-girlfriend. The protagonist found a beautiful woman and immediately initiated the counterattack mission. The system showed the state of the girl named Luego, who is 21 years old. Importantly, she told the protagonist that when the host's favorability index exceeds 90%, 10% of the money spent will revert to the host's personal wealth. When the favorability level reaches 100%, the host's status will change, and the relationship between the host and the target will change. With the girl's favorability currently at 20%, the protagonist approached her to ask if he could bother her for a moment. The girl asked if he planned to ask for help again, telling him to give up since his girlfriend found a rich second-generation boyfriend. However, the protagonist misunderstood and just wanted to invite her for a milk tea, thinking of testing the system with her. The girl rejected the protagonist's offer because she didn't know him well, and this wasn't an ordinary milk tea, as a cup cost 10 days' worth of fast food. She asked if he could afford it, but people in line urged the protagonist to hurry up because they also wanted to buy. The protagonist asked everyone to wait for a moment and asked the girl how many cups of milk tea were in line. She replied that there were 180 cups in total. The protagonist swiped his card, and the machine confirmed a successful expenditure of 39,800. The girl told the protagonist to pack everything quickly, surprising some people who didn't expect him to actually make the purchase. Others praise, but the important thing is that the girl's favorability has increased, the protagonist approaches her and says he has a small favor to ask. When she asks what he needs, he replies that he needs her to spend money at a store where the bag his girlfriend wanted is. The girl's friend shows the protagonist the bag and says it's a limited edition bag from the store, costing $38,000. He asks the protagonist if he's going to buy it and if he cares about it. However, just as the protagonist is about to answer, he is interrupted by his ex-girlfriend, who asks if he is cheating again. She tells the protagonist that they're done because he was so unpleasant. The protagonist simply asks, who's following whom, since he's just following someone to buy a bag. The ex-girlfriend asks how he can buy a bag with someone else and if he couldn't come up with a better excuse to play the fool. Meanwhile, the system alerts the protagonist to start the counterattack mission against the antagonist. He tells her that since they broke up, they are no longer involved, and she can do whatever she wants. He asks if she thinks he's still the same person as before, but Ryder, the girl, says it's only been a few hours. She asks if he went from poor to rich in that time. The protagonist tells her to think about it and says he can't afford it now, as buying just one bag is not enough. He calls the saleswoman and says he'll take everything in the store, surprising everyone. The total price is $11.32 million, and the protagonist asks if he can pay for it. His friends call him crazy, but when he swipes the card, it goes through, leaving him surprised. He wonders if he really bought everything, and the girl hugs him, calling him kind. Unlike some people on the surface who are affectionate with their girlfriends but unwilling to spend money, 
the protagonist keeps a low profile. A lady approaches him, and he seems to know her. She asks what he's doing there, saying he bought clothes, shoes, watches, and even lent a car, but he was actually looking for a lover behind her back. It seems the lover is a sycophant trying to justify what he did. Approaching the protagonist's ex-girlfriend, the girl admits she made a mistake and points to her, saying she seduced him because she is the only one in his heart. The girl then tells the protagonist that she will give him a chance if he slaps the ex-girlfriend twice. If he does, she will forgive him, otherwise, they are done. The protagonist doesn't hesitate and slaps the ex-girlfriend, who falls to the ground. She approaches him, calling him a cheater who seduces other people's boyfriends. People tell the protagonist that the necklace she is wearing is his, causing so much humiliation that she quickly asks for help. However, the protagonist turns away and ignores her, making her leave crying. In the meantime, we can observe how the system shows the protagonist as more favorable, making him wonder why she is indifferent, but her favoritism for him has increased. Instead of reciprocating, he cancels and tells her he didn't expect Venti to be such a person, especially considering she's a nun. He thinks it's lamentable and wonders if the protagonist will soften her heart. However, the protagonist smiles and tells her that a gold digger doesn't deserve sympathy and that she should leave him alone. Hearing these words, she thinks Venti is completely dead to the protagonist and tells him that he was so kind to her that she doesn't know how to repay him. This makes the protagonist suggest that she could pay with her body. She gets all embarrassed, and the protagonist tells her to stop talking nonsense. In the meantime, we can observe how her favorability increases even more, reaching 68% for the protagonist. With the waters calm, the girl tells the protagonist that it's not impolite of him to come, and she can spend some money. With her, she ends up taking the protagonist to a store and tells him that she doesn't know how to dress and that it's not surprising that some people belittle her. After trying on some clothes, the protagonist decides to go with one that really suits him, surprising everyone, including the local girls who didn't expect him to be so handsome. The girls think that his ex-girlfriend didn't know how to appreciate him and that he will now be theirs. When the protagonist sees himself in the mirror, he is also surprised by his own appearance. However, he knows that all this happened thanks to money. Time passes, and we move to the girl's room where one of them arrives at his apartment, happy about what happened to the protagonist. However, upon entering, she is surprised to see the protagonist's girlfriends and asks what happened to her face, as she is clearly well-dressed and is a total change. She smiles and says she's fine thanks to the protagonist, who helped to reveal her true nature, otherwise, she would have been lost in the darkness. She shows the bag that the protagonist bought for her, and when the friend asks about it, she responds that the protagonist bought it for her and that she should get used to it. Seeing that the bag is not a problem, she hugs the protagonist's boyfriend and says she was worried if he would mind, but he said no, as they are all good sisters. However, both of them think otherwise, with the protagonist's girlfriend thinking that she cannot interfere in their three-year relationship, while the other girl wonders if she was blind not to recognize the protagonist as a rich boy, saying that he is now hers. The protagonist tells the friends of the protagonist who were nearby that he is tired after a day of shopping with his girl. However, he worries about the idea of having to spend money every time he wants to buy something. The protagonist's thoughts are interrupted by some guys, and one of them approaches and asks the protagonist how much the outfit costs. This guy, named, tells the protagonist that he heard about what happened to his girlfriend and tries to cheer him up by telling him to look on the bright side. In his opinion, the protagonist spent a lot of money on his girlfriend but still left her. He shows the protagonist his phone, suggesting that he should do a live stream to receive donations, saying that the host will obey if the protagonist gives gifts during the stream. Also, the friend of this guy tells the protagonist that if he gives gifts during the stream, the goddess will surrender to him if necessary. However, he warns that this is not for the faint of heart. The protagonist is excited by this information as he sees the opportunity to earn a lot of money during the live stream. He thanks the guy, who wonders how the protagonist can thank him since he behaved strangely. However, one of the friends says it doesn't matter because it's not fun, and they should go watch Zacks alive. The protagonist arrives in his room and quickly downloads the app that will allow him to watch the girls live to make donations. After downloading the app, he searches for the name of the girl mentioned by the guys, Zaxa, whom he was surprised by her energy, and wonders if he can start a counterattack mission with this ranking screen. The system appears and tells the protagonist that the normal target value must be at least 80 points to start the counterattack mission, and the live stream is affected by beauty screen effects, 
so it is impossible to judge unless they are offline. The protagonist agrees with the system, thinking that Sasha must have a score above 90, and he shouldn't worry. He goes back to watching Sasha's stream and sees a gift, a golden tiger sent by someone named. The value of this gift is over $10,000. The protagonist is confused about how to send gifts while watching, and Sean in the stream chat says that the opponent will definitely use some useless tactics and try to set the pace, but they shouldn't worry about the opponent's tactics, they should spend all their efforts. Your strength, as soon as the game starts, he also mentions that there will be a live battle. However, the protagonist interrupts the conversation to ask Sasha how much time he needs to recharge to become the first on the list, asking whether he should first buy the gift or first mark the brand here. They say the protagonist is at level 1 while the salt is at level 24, and yet the protagonist considers himself too poor to have money. This seems to displease Zaxa, who decides to kick the protagonist out of the live broadcast because the protagonist did not send her any gifts. So, he asks the administrators to kick him out. Upon seeing that he has been expelled, the protagonist decides to check how much money he can send in the Schwan room. He asks Chua what will happen if he surrenders, and she suggests a lighter punishment if he does. However, the protagonist asks what the problem is, and the anchoring begins the battle. When the battle starts, it becomes clear that Zaxa is winning by a large margin with a score of 58,000 against the protagonist's 22. His followers encourage him not to surrender. However, Zaxa receives a notification that Muido Pobra Para Turdin Hero, too poor to have money, sent a golden dragon as a gift, valued at 15,000 coins. She thanks the protagonist for the gift, is surprised to find out that he is too poor to have money, and the protagonist impresses everyone by sending 10 golden dragons, increasing Sasha's score from 58,000 to 52,000. He continues to send golden dragons, surprising everyone even more. The protagonist sends a total of 1,600 golden dragons, astonishing everyone present. Sasha finally asks him to wait, questioning why he doesn't wait until he has double the points during the battle. However, the protagonist doesn't stop sending golden dragons. When he finally stops, Zaxa realizes that he has been watching her live stream for a year and has had over 1 million views. She is impressed with the amount of money he sent. Sasha is moved by the 24 million coins she received with the 1,600 golden dragons but is also happy. She asks why he is still sitting there and if he is afraid, challenging him to stand up and accept the punishment. The punishment involves bowing, spinning in circles, and jumping at the same time in a single move. She still keeps her word and challenges him. He accepts the challenge but apologizes to the protagonist for expelling him earlier, admitting that he was wrong. She becomes very upset that, if it weren't for young Master Yu, the 1,600 golden dragons would have been hers. It is important to note that the live stream audience started calling the protagonist, Mr. Money, because it became clear that it was thanks to him that Miss Zaxa managed to beat Miss Yu. The final score showed that Miss Sasha had 58,600 points, while Miss Yu had over 2 million, indicating a significant difference. After the broadcast, the system informs the protagonist that young Master Yu, level 24, has left the live broadcast room. The protagonist receives messages from Miss Dim, Miss Shui, and Miss Zaxa, apologizing sincerely and asking if they can be friends or even brothers. Miss Shui thanks the protagonist and asks to be added to contacts, sending her phone number. Miss Zaxa says she was about to kick out young Master Yu but didn't expect him to leave first. She apologizes to the protagonist and suggests making amends, inviting him to dinner since she noticed he's in the town of Anginia and she'll be passing through for a photo session. She's worried that the protagonist may not want to spend money on her, but he accepts the invitation, making her happy. The next day, the protagonist wakes up feeling well rested. However, he receives a message that interrupts him before seeing who sent the message. His roommate suggests they have breakfast together, but the protagonist declines, explaining that a girl will bring breakfast. This surprises his roommates. The protagonist's roommates didn't expect him to start saying strange things so early in the morning. One of his roommates mentions hearing that the protagonist was dumped by his girlfriend, but the night before, he seemed so relaxed, which piques his curiosity. The protagonist wonders about it too, as he had pursued his girlfriend for three years. The scene shifts to the girl's dormitory, where a guy is at the entrance with a gift, not breakfast. Apparently, each guy will give breakfast to one of the girls, and the protagonist's girlfriend is on the list. They question why this guy is giving breakfast, 
and he explains that he's doing it because he pursued the protagonist's ex-girlfriend for three years. This is due to the fact that the ex-girlfriend and the protagonist had recently posted on social media that they were completely single and in love. So, this guy thought they were referring to them. One of the guys, who also wanted to give breakfast to the girls, is the redhead from before. He boasts about his light and sweet breakfast, noodles with French restaurant milk toppings, costing about $600, or well, $601. While flaunting his breakfast, he tells his friends that to win a girl, it's just a matter of money. If you give her a few dollars a day for a year, she'll just think you're cheap. But with a few hundred dollars a day, you could have her in a week. However, when the expected girls arrive, the protagonist and the boys immediately rush to give them breakfast. The redhead, who wanted to give breakfast to the protagonist's ex-girlfriend, recognizes her and compliments her appearance. He tells her that he bought her breakfast that day, light and sweet noodles with low calories from the French restaurant. However, as he continues to boast about the breakfast, the protagonist realizes that he forgot to thank the redhead for bringing breakfast. The redhead asks the protagonist if he just arrived and if he's also going to buy breakfast for his ex-girlfriend who left yesterday. He reassures the protagonist that it's not a problem for him, given the protagonist's persistence over the last three years. The redhead tells the protagonist that today is not his lucky day and suggests he come back early the next day. However, the protagonist manages to approach him and asks if he hasn't had breakfast yet. The protagonist replies that he hasn't, as she had invited him and sent a message in the morning saying she would treat him to dinner. The protagonist's roommates are surprised by this, as a girl did bring breakfast for him. When they realize this, the girl who brought breakfast for the protagonist looks surprised. The protagonist's ex-girlfriend, seeing that she has approached him, knows she needs to hurry, as every step she takes, no matter how simple, could have a point to it. Returning to her, she lovingly offers the breakfast that the redhead gave to the protagonist while we watched as the system told the protagonist that his favorability was increasing even more. This makes the protagonist wonder why the girl brought breakfast, but he questions why her favorability increased. The protagonist's ex-girlfriend, upon seeing that she didn't want to be left behind, also brings breakfast to the protagonist. As she passes by, she tells the protagonist that it's Ant's breakfast set for 368,000 years that she bought especially for him. She confesses that she made a mistake the day before, and the protagonist would have to repay her. Getting very close to the protagonist, she tells him that she understands that he has given so much in the last three years and that she is very excited. The protagonist used to bring breakfast every day and because she was too naive, she allowed herself to be deceived. That's why she asks the protagonist if he will forgive her when she sees that she wants to try. For the past three years, every time he was disappointed with her, she would try to give up, making this gesture. However, when he returned to being her puppy, she would immediately distance herself. Since the protagonist didn't want to be controlled again, he turned and told her that it wasn't good for his puppy to see her so close. In other words, the protagonist, who used to not care about how many suitors she had and even worried about her image, now raises the idea that he still likes her. Meanwhile, the other girl thought that the protagonist had pushed away his ex-girlfriend because she had used this trick before, but apparently, it didn't work this time. She said it must be her fault. While they were pondering this, the protagonist wondered how these two increased their affection at the same time. Others who also had questions were wondering what was happening because the protagonist's ex-boyfriend and another person were pleading together with the protagonist. So, they wondered if the two girls were good friends. However, the girls told the protagonist to eat his breakfast, and when he sat down, his ex-girlfriend approached him and told him to open his mouth, while the other girl was a bit upset because the protagonist's ex-boyfriend was gaining ground. Surprised at what he was seeing, the protagonist asked why they were stealing his spotlight. A man with red hair asked the protagonist who the ex-girlfriend was. The protagonist answered the man's question, saying that she had called him more than 1,600 times in a row the previous night, and he got cramps. Thanks to God, someone fed him today. The protagonist's ex-girlfriend, wanting to take advantage of the situation, held the protagonist's hand and asked if he was in pain, saying that he should let her come later. She said she didn't want to be parked by the protagonist's ex-girlfriend, drawing the protagonist's attention, saying that the noodles were delicious. With a beautiful girl in front of him, who would say no? The protagonist agreed that it was delicious but didn't like the bright red color. When she asked why it was bright red, saying that her noodles were all pink, he whispered to her that he would change the color later, 
causing the protagonist to vomit blood from what he heard. Meanwhile, a man with yellow hair or the protagonist just relaxed with his two girls feeding him. However, someone took photos of the protagonist and immediately sent them to Campos mailbox. The title of the photo is, The Girl from the Language Course Class in the Literature Department Who is Giving Breakfast to the Protagonist. Upon seeing the email, Campos immediately informs the protagonist who is in the news, and people from the news department are coming to interview. However, when he says he is the protagonist, he flees the place. Upon hearing this, his friend says that the protagonist used to be a rich boy with a low profile who didn't like to show off. The protagonist thinks that nobody from the journalism department is following him, but he receives a message from Miss Sasha saying she will disembark at Jean Agus Airport at 7.30 that night and asks if he will pick her up. He is eager to meet Miss Sasha. Arriving at the airport, the protagonist was already there, thinking that Miss Sasha had said she was off the plane because he hadn't seen her yet. He wonders if she's the type his mother wouldn't recognize after using a beauty mask. The protagonist ends up finding Miss Sasha, who was being harassed by some of her followers. Since the protagonist wouldn't allow that, he stood in front of her and told the guy it was time for him to get a new pair of glasses, as he couldn't even understand Miss Sasha's expression. The protagonist was simply asked by Miss Zaxa who he was. However, before the protagonist could respond, Miss Zaxa recognized him, telling him that his clothes were the same as WX's. She didn't know what WX was, but they continued, and the protagonist confirmed that indeed, he was Mr. Kean, the money master. While the glasses-wearing guy apologized, Miss Sasha told the protagonist that he arrived at the right moment, as someone had bothered her, claiming to be her fan. As soon as he appeared, she didn't know him at all and always thought the protagonist was a big businessman around 40 years old. However, she was surprised to discover that he was young and handsome. The protagonist told her to just call him Link and complimented her, saying he didn't expect her to look better than in the live broadcast. At this moment, the protagonist received a system message instructing him to start the counterattack mission. The system informed the protagonist that the counterattack mission should begin at the airport exit after receiving Miss Zaxa. Seeing him, she immediately asked why he was there. He replied that he was there to pick her up since he couldn't let her take a taxi alone. Startled, she asked him who the person next to him was. She answered that the protagonist was the direct man whose username was too poor to have money. Miss Zaxa recognized the protagonist due to the fame he gained in the first battle but didn't expect him to be so young. He wouldn't have come to pick her up if he knew the protagonist was coming in a car worth more than 5 million. She also didn't know what kind of car the protagonist was driving, but he claimed it was a small electric car, surprising Miss Zaxa. After leaving the airport, the protagonist's motorcycle is tied on top of the luxurious car worth more than 5 million. While looking at the motorcycle, the protagonist wonders if the money he paid in the directory, over 20 million, is real. This surprises the protagonist, who thinks the protagonist is very discreet and tells him that Miss Zaxa wouldn't mind taking the small electric car, but it would be more. It is convenient for her to take her car as luggage. He asks the protagonist if he thinks this is true, and the protagonist responds affirmatively. However, Miss Sasha apparently is not convinced of the protagonist's identity and wonders if he is really the person they were expecting. When they reach their destination, which appears to be a restaurant, Miss Sasha enters immediately, greeting all the guests. She introduces the protagonist as the man who defeated young Master Hugo and knocked out his teeth in the fight the night before. This surprises everyone, as they all comment that the protagonist looks very young. The protagonist thinks that Miss Sasha invited him to dinner to make amends, but she actually invited some big shots who gave her gifts to accompany him. She says, so, this is Miss Sasha's boss scene, and the famous live announcer has a lot of heart when starting dinner. She comments to everyone that the protagonist always drives a small electric donkey to accompany Miss Sasha. This makes one of them laugh, perhaps considering it a joke from the protagonist. How is it possible that he doesn't have money to buy a car if he spent more than 20 million on gifts? Looking at the protagonist, he asks if this is true because if 20 million is just the protagonist's pocket money, he must have more than $1 billion. Patting the protagonist on the shoulder, he says he knows a lot of people in an age. Still, the protagonist says his name is Link and that he doesn't know anyone rich in Anna with that name. It seems this guy was investigating the protagonist, as people laughed when they heard his words, telling Miss Sasha not to be fooled. Trickery meanwhile, 
Miss Zaxa asks the protagonist if he is truly an imposter and if he will allow him to take her donkey in his car. Another person also asks Miss Zaxa if she has ever seen a photo of the protagonist, leaving her speechless. We can observe that her favorability has dropped to minus 10% with this response. She seems to think that she confirmed on the protagonist's phone that he is too poor to have money, but she's not worried because she just wants him as her ATM. She thanks the protagonist for always caring about her but establishes that there is no link between the three main families in Shanghai. She asks the protagonist if he is the young master of the family in Shanghai, making everyone laugh a bit and thinking that Miss Sasha is speaking for him, but she actually just wants to confirm his identity. He responds that he doesn't know the Link family but is sure he doesn't have as much money as them, making everyone laugh again. The chubby guy warns the protagonist to be careful as he might get struck by light. He also thinks the protagonist probably won over $20 million in the lottery since he couldn't get a date with his aunt. Miss Charge mocks the protagonist in a striped tie, saying he claimed to have more money than the Link family. Then, she asks the protagonist what kind of car he drives and how many supercars are in his collection. However, the protagonist approaches Miss Sasha and asks what type of car she likes because he will buy one for her right away. Nevertheless, they continue underestimating the protagonist, telling him not to talk nonsense and that he cannot pretend to be rich. Miss Zaxa answers the protagonist's question, saying she loves the Ferrari F60, and if he gives it to her, she will give him an equivalent value gift. However, we can see that her favorability drops even more, reaching minus 15% compared to the protagonist. This seems to impress the protagonist, as the surface is full of enthusiasm, but his favorability is plummeting, and this acting skill can kill a lot of fresh meat, so to speak. Having said that, the protagonist simply leaves and goes to buy the car for Miss Zaxa. Half an hour later, those leaving the place thought the protagonist was just a clown, as he really played the fool, while Miss Chaya thought the outbreak was really a liar. Originally, still, there was a spark of hope, but at that moment, it was blinded by several lights all at once. These lights were coming from sports cars, and in the midst of them was the protagonist. They were surprised to see all the sports cars in the location, and the protagonist immediately apologized to Mr. Nyo because he couldn't get out of his multi-million dollar car. Literally, the protagonist was mocking him, and now it was his turn to be embarrassed. Mr. Nyo was so excited that he expressed his desire to buy a sports car and asked the protagonist to help him choose. The protagonist didn't seal the deal since his business was to provide services, and his assets were verified by the Dragon Band's Black Daemon card, which surprised everyone upon hearing its name. It required at least a billion in assets to obtain it. The protagonist claimed that his cars were fake, probably rented to impress, but Mr. Mill reassured everyone, stating that he knew Chief knew well and that there was a reason for his respect. The protagonist approached Miss Zaxa, saying that she arrived at the right time, as all the hardware cost more than 15 million, which he considered cheap, and he couldn't gift her one. This made Miss Zaxa ask why he thought it was cheap, and the protagonist explained that Chief Nu said those who like the Ferrari F60 also like the Ferrari LF, and he would buy one for her. The protagonist swiped the card, and the cost of the Ferrari was 32 million, surprising everyone. They were amazed that the protagonist spent so much. With over 30 million in a car, Mr. Nyo handed the keys to the protagonist and asked if it was a gift for his girlfriend. The protagonist replied that it wasn't because it was the most expensive thing he could get at his dealership, but he was planning to buy an even more expensive one, maybe a 100 million. Miss Sasha already thanked the protagonist, but he insisted there was no need to thank him as he enjoyed spending his money. This made Miss Sasha like him even more. Apologizing for the misunderstanding, they apologized to the protagonist, who confirmed it was all a misunderstanding. They apologized while he adjusted his pinstripe tie and heard that the protagonist planned to buy an even more expensive car. The protagonist mentioned that the director of the city's largest car dealership, Jean and Yang, had many more advanced supercars, though he wasn't sure if he could impress the protagonist. They suggested taking a look and offering the biggest discount as a sincere apology. However, before the protagonist could respond, Miss Chai approached him, expressing her desire to test the car and asking if he could accompany her. This led the protagonist to ask her why she didn't test the car alone, but she whispered in his ear that she thought about it and would have to return the gift if she did. She suggested that she could only return it in installments, with the first payment being made in the same place where they were together, just the two of them. During this conversation, he blushed, thinking that a popular presenter who knows how to work had piqued his curiosity. Therefore, 
the protagonist decides to go with the girl in the car. While alone, she hands him a pen and asks if he can sign her leg. However, when the protagonist lifts her leg slightly, she becomes embarrassed. In the end, the protagonist signs it, and she explains that it's a record of the payments she made, marking each payment. The protagonist asks if she's satisfied, and she responds affirmative. After a while, they arrive at a hotel where she was live-streaming to her followers, telling them she went to the city of Yang and didn't expect the protagonist to give her a car without saying anything. You can see what her followers are saying about it. While Miss Chai was live-streaming, a man in a suit approaches the protagonist, saying that a group of wealthy people wants to meet Mr. Keen, meaning the protagonist. The protagonist agrees to join the group, but at that moment, he receives a call. He doesn't know who the caller is, but the person on the other end says they received a message that the class 3 of the school would organize a meeting tomorrow in Anchian, where the protagonist also studies. He asks if the protagonist wants to go, and the protagonist agrees, as he has nothing else to do. He heard that Genji, who is now a star in the literature department of Andiang University, will also be at the meeting, despite being former classmates. He tells her that only he gave her enough money to take care of her. The other girl supports, saying that she thinks she's only safe holding a wine glass. Then, he apologizes, saying he got stuck in traffic without mentioning how beautiful she is, even without makeup. The system evaluates her appearance at 94 points, finding it great that the system scores are so high. Phone Billing invites Zaxuam to sit next to him, mentioning that there's also a vacant seat next to him. She sits beside him, saying that she hasn't seen him in a long time, without even mentioning that she thought she had forgotten his name. She replies that she remembers everyone's name in the room. Her passion level for him is 0%, shocking everyone, thinking about how bold and daring it is to sit next to the school queen. Bill comes over, bothering a university student for three years, asking why he didn't bring her here, everyone would like to meet her. Linda replies that they broke up the day before yesterday. Phone Billing asks how they broke up, then, after hearing the backstory of chasing her for three years, he continues by saying, let's go. He only says that because he needs to. One of the girls says that only fools can be deceived by such lies. She says, so what? Is that so ugly? She used to consider him an honest man, but even after college, he became a scoundrel. Linda replies that she's just telling the truth. The inflation index drops by 1% and Linda doesn't know what to do. He realizes this is his chance. He heard that she is interested in artifacts, and he recently bought a late 20th century painting from a collector in Shanghai. He asks if she wants to take a look. She gets up and goes to the painting, and Fong Billing follows the path, putting his hand on her shoulder, calling her a beggar to let her know her place. Zaxuam tries to please her, and then he adds that there's one more thing, he would make it impossible for the queen to find a job. In Hugo Jung, even after graduation, he approaches Dixiaxian and tells her how much he likes this paint. In a few days, an auction will be held in the city where another painting, Blessing of the Angels, will be sold. He tells Fong Billing that he didn't know he was interested in Renaissance artists. She asks if she can take a closer look, and he says yes, please. She considers it and thinks to herself that it worked. It took him a long time and effort to learn these hobbies, even though they're nothing special. Linda says he's also interested in Da Vinci's paintings and asks if they can look at the painting. The system reports that the artifact assessment skill was selected with a smile, but thinks to itself that yes, he is a fool and will regret it. Then he wonders if he curses and also likes to give a 20 if he would like to share his opinion. He wonders what he thinks of this image. Zenling says it's fake and continues to say that in his later work, he favored the fine repainting technique. A small amount of pigment in a large amount of castor oil was used to make the paint, and each stroke has a translucent effect. The colors of this painting are opaque due to the excess of pigment. Additionally, he likes to shade the corners of the eyes and mouth of the figures to achieve an infinitely rough effect. Then they look at China in shock. He tells the female that unfortunately, this Maria is fake. He angrily bought a forgery, and the eye starts to tremble. Fong Beiler says that an amateur would probably believe his words, but he is not like that. He immediately sees that he acquired some worn-out expert skills on the internet. Others think that pretending is right and should be stopped. Then, if there was one, she goes past him. She said she also studied da Vinci's paintings, and yes, beautiful, she is right. This is a high-quality imitation. Everyone is shocked, opening their mouths and screaming. Then, hearing the head syndrome, 
he asks how Zenling acquired knowledge. Fang Billy, a man specialized in rare and exquisite artifacts, responds that he learned to appreciate many cultural relics and art objects since child. He became deeply saddened when he realized that foreign countries deprived his homeland of so many cultural values. His goal is to buy back all the artifacts and return them to his country. Chili then laughs and says he almost believes him, thinking he can actually retrieve all the artifacts. Fang Billy responds that with a certain amount of money, there is nothing he cannot buy. Everyone laughs at his words. After these remarks, she had the same dreams and realistic goals, the degree of her passion increased by 5%. Dreams of restoring these artifacts seem distant, just a goal he will definitely achieve. Fong Bill, intensely angry, decides to somehow show off in front of him and try to steal his thunder. He decides it's worth showing the poor man his rightful place. Food is brought to the table, Tuscany salad, Brussels chocolate souffle, Canadian veal leg with seasonal vegetables, and venison stew with salad and spices. People at the table admire how delicious it smells, they have never eaten such sumptuous food before. They wonder why all the dishes are different. Fong Billy responds with a smile, saying he doesn't know, the chef decides what to serve. The chef used to work at a three-star Michelin restaurant and has a bit of personality. It all depends on his mood when cooking. He mentions that it seems Linda brought bad luck, as they brought him smelly bread and the same salad pieces. No one mentions it steamed bread. Fong Billy suggests it might be molecular cuisine, Michelin-starred chefs love to cook things like distant strawberry-flavored items. He takes a piece of bread with a fork, thinking that, as expected, they are steamed buns and zucchini. There's nothing surprising about it. Fong Beer asks Linda with a smile how steamed buns from a Michelin-starred chef taste. If he doesn't like it, he'll ask the chef to remove the dish and prepare a new one. But the chef's dishes are of high quality. High quality takes 1 minute 2 hours to prepare. The girl next to him says it's worth waiting 2 hours to try the Michelin chef's dishes. He says yes, not waiting, he won't be able to go to karaoke on an empty stomach and starts laughing. The girl responds, saying that what comes next is karaoke, which is great, but teases him, looking shocked while Zenning talks to Zaya. She explains that the gold mask's no-side pattern is for both aesthetics and wrinkle elimination. The wisdom of the ancients never ceases to amaze. Zaishu's inflation rate is increasing by 2%, she informs them. In Linz, she says she thinks her experience is almost equal to that of her teachers. Next time, Zinni could join them and appreciate some artifacts together. Phone billing is completely shocked. Then a notification arrives on the phone, with a link that he has already used, inviting him to join the Prince's Millions group. Dispensa says he was invited by his Eleven yesterday to join today's rich crew. Zine opens the group, reads the dialogue, and thinks maybe he should send an intense welcome gift here. As he can't spend money on a man, he'll find a girl. He notices a girl in the group who seems pretty, he sends 18,880,000 yen to a smiling angle. He writes that he can't send a big red envelope, so he just transferred the money. This causes shock and admiration among the other group members. A user asks Linda where he is now and if he wants to go to Mary Singh. He responds that he's right there now, and all the group members who are also nearby go to him. Phone Billion, who invited the rich man to the Merit, writes to him that he is the young owner of the Merit and gives his full name. He will pay for everything he spends today at his bar. He can buy whatever he wants, Ziming responds with a smile telling him that what he's writing is not worth spending so much money on a brush without thinking. How coincidental that it's Fong Billion, the name of a high-ranking prince, replies that it doesn't even need to be discussed. He is a hospitable person, that's all. Who would have thought? He looks at himself with a sinister smile and thinks it's over. Now he knows many rich and powerful people, making even more connections. He decides that when the rich arrive, he just needs to complain to them about Zimming. He imagines how he will tell the rich that it's worth drinking, showing dissatisfaction with his appearance. Some of them will ask if Mr. Funk is in a bad mood, and he will reply that only a brainless fool won't leave him alone. Immediately, everyone around starts asking who this bastard is and how he dares to offend Mr. Funk. The rich will say that Ling is crying and lying on the ground, ensuring he can't stay in an age. Others support him, saying they will help too. They will tell the Human Resources Department to fire Zimming. Fong Billion thinks with a smile that this way, he can get to know a new rich man, humiliate Ling, and show off to his rich friends. He will kill three birds with one stone because he is clever. Fong Billion stands up and asks if everyone has eaten properly. He invites everyone to the karaoke room on the top floor, 
where he has arranged a meeting with some of the rich people in the city to communicate with the upper class. Everyone is shocked because they didn't know that Fong Billion had these connections. They all go down to the Golden Splendor Hall and settle into large sofas. Welcome to your rich hosts. Those who came with him think Fong Billion is so handsome. It seems they are from different worlds. One of the guys says that Fong invited them to meet famous people from now on. He will spend more time with Lion. Fong Billion introduces Chico Han, the main owner of the property, Mr. Chu, and also introduces Mr. Chu. When he hears about the Asia family, he says he met her father, Zia, holding a glass in his hand, isolating himself. The man continues, saying he heard she is very beautiful, and that's true. Then, a worker approaches Fong Billion, apologizing and starting to say something to him. The worker points to Ziming, his classmate, saying he would like to order a bottle of Aurora Rosso cherry wine. He's not sure if he should open the bottle for him. He asks if he really wants to order a bottle of Aurora Rosso cherry wine. All his classmates are shocked saying he's gone mad. This wine is worth thousands of dollars. Funk would go to dinner and karaoke with his old classmates and not order such an expensive wine at their expense. It's just some kind of misunderstanding. Shining obviously doesn't know how expensive this wine is. The man with a smile says that he really wants to order this wine and continues saying that it's okay, one of his wealthy acquaintances will pay for it. Fong Billion asks if it really happens, saying that he has this acquaintance. He allows, in this case, to open the bottle. Ziming thinks to himself that this is his chance. The waiter opens the wine, and people think that In Ling really has these connections. Who would have thought, it remains about Zine, and he raises the bottle, shouting that the Aurora Russo caramel filled costs 250,000 per bottle and is already open, so it's too late to regret. If the tycoon's friends can't pay, he will have to pay by mining coal. His uncle owns a coal company, so he can definitely find a place for him without in Ling's 250,000 links. He really doesn't understand why without thinking to himself that he expected the longer the name, the more expensive the price. Fong Billion says yes, he will be more careful when his hands suggest, and then he will think more before buying something. Fong Billion asks about how everyone is. Almost everyone is here because the wealthy man said he would be in Marite, but he's still not here. Someone said that the wealthy man. In the group chat, it was announced that Fong Bill Iam had already arrived at the Golden Splendor Hall. Billion is shocked and exclaims that he is already here. Zoom then enters, saying it seems he is the last one. Fong Bill Iam approaches him, extending his hand, but Mashelson passes by, ignoring him. Tozin hurries and extends his hand with a smile, expressing his desire to embrace the wealthy man. It turns out that he arrived not long ago, and everyone had to wait for him. The crowd is in shock after these words, looking at them and they start shouting at the same time, saying, Sir Rich, you're a truly wealthy man. Fong Bill I am doesn't understand what's happening and shouts that it can't be. Billions, knowing it can only be him, approach and he becomes the center of attention. All colleagues are shocked by this revelation, actively discussing the events. Someone shouts that it's impossible, he doesn't know what Zenling is up to, but he fooled everyone here. They know his parents only work part-time, and he's just a poor guy in Linda, he can't be a wealthy man. At 11, someone shouts at Fong Bill to face the truth, adding that he's the worst in the group, the most ignorant, incapable of spending anything other than hundreds of thousands of dollars per month. He lost money in stocks without earning a penny, bringing shame to their group. They decide to expel Fong Bill in 2 million, and furthermore, they insult him, saying they will pay all his expenses today. He asks the bartender to serve the most expensive drinks for everyone in the room. Billions are defeated, he was depressed by what was happening, mentally acknowledging that he deserved it. As the party ends, he bids farewell to all his colleagues since he has to leave first. While his colleagues watch her leave, they rejoice among themselves, praising her discreet but immense wealth. However, the protagonist is surprised because she is a rich girl exposed to high society since childhood, yet she shows no surprise at her wealth and does not increase her favorability. For the protagonist, such a challenging person is indeed a great target to spend his money on. However, his thoughts are interrupted by Mr. Jania, who shows his phone, revealing that he previously said he didn't like cars that cost 30 to 40 million. That's why he found a car equivalent to 80 million, with only 10 in the world, and not even in China. He wonders if the protagonist likes it, and the protagonist agrees, saying it looks good, and that's the chosen one. Wow, 
he can't believe it. Imagine a car worth 80 million, my god. This car is literally coated in gold. He is happy because he closed this 80 million deal with the protagonist. Happily, he rushes off while telling the protagonist that he is right, as the protagonist speaks very quickly. He will take care of it and it will be there in a few days, I mean, the car will be there in a few days. I am curious to see the protagonist looking at his people, saying that he will have to spend a lot of money to recover something. But my god, just look at the numbers in that amount of money, they are literally in the millions. After that, the protagonist was on his way to his room when he encounters his ex-girlfriend. Upon seeing him, she quickly tells the protagonist that he finally came back, yes, literally, she was waiting for the protagonist. Embracing the arms of the protagonist, she tells him that her father had a heart attack and is now in the hospital, needing surgery. However, her family cannot afford so much money at once, which is why she asks the protagonist if he can lend it to her. However, the protagonist, a bit upset, tells her that it's been three years, and she still believes he doesn't know her perfectly. He tells her that she used the excuse of her family being sick five times, and this time borrowed more. 800,000 online loans to buy famous brands. Telling her that he won't lend a penny more, she becomes indignant. But upon hearing that he just spent over 10 million on nonsense, she is not willing to deal with 800,000. This prompts the protagonist to tell her that she has no control over how she wants to spend her own money and with whom she wants to spend it. This makes her ask the prota if he is so ruthless, telling him that less than a week has passed since they broke up, but the protagonist just thanks her, saying that he finally had some good days thanks to her but has a dinner date tomorrow. So don't speak anymore, or well, shouldn't speak and goodbye to the girl. In the face of this, she tells the protagonist that he can't treat her like that. This causes her favorability to drop even further, giving the protagonist a minus 20%. However, in the face of this, the protagonist thinks that after experiencing what happened with Vanchel, he thought he would change but was thinking too much. The next day, the protagonist, who was walking with his phone, tells us that he sent the location and told her to come there for dinner. However, the protagonist doesn't go because he says that women shouldn't stop him from raising money to hire. However, the protagonist receives a notification that Miss Sasha is live. Furthermore, she said that she's customizing gifts for her guests, something the main character finds interesting. Upon entering the room, he immediately receives a notification from Miss Sasha informing him that someone considered very poor has entered the room. Miss Sasha said that this is very promising, and the protagonist warmly asks if she wants him to go down to her. However, the protagonist does not respond and proceeds to send the God of Fortune. Here it is explained that the God of Fortune is an exclusive customized gift by the protagonist, valued at 800 each. This surprises the girl as it is a considerable amount. The surprise increases when she sees that the protagonist continues to send them, totaling 341 gods of fortune, equivalent to 300 million. Clearly, this greatly increases her favorability by 20%. She is willing to face any challenge the protagonist proposes, specifying that he can request any talent, and she will execute them one by one. However, she receives the bad news that the protagonist has ended the live broadcast, which makes her very sad. While she was a little depressed because the protagonist left the room, he was celebrating because after spending 300 million, he would be reimbursed 30 million, which made him very happy. He realizes what is happening and says the protagonist just gave him a sports car and another 300 million. This is understandable since he said he bought a sports car to mock those bosses. However, she didn't ask for anything from the protagonist. Presently, she has no challenges in her life, and that's why she wonders why he gave her so much money. Perhaps the protagonist is in love with her. She remembers that men are not trustworthy and that he is just her ATM, and he would never fall in love with her. Nevertheless, she feels intrigued when she sees the protagonist's photo at the school entrance. He mentioned that he would call Aditi. At that moment, she hears shouts from the bullies asking their girlfriends if they think she wouldn't be recognized. They spot her and ask where she wants to go. She notices the protagonist but believes he won't help, and that's exactly what happens. The protagonist turns around and walks away. The girl tells the bully that she really has no money now but might be able to get something in three days. However, they don't want to hear it. They ask if she really thinks they can trust her and she says she will borrow money. This makes them laugh and ask where her boyfriend is. She says he broke her heart, but they don't want to hear more and decide to use her to recover the money. As they try to take her away, she thinks about the protagonist, realizing it's not his fault. She regrets spending so much. 
Money had been so vain, as perhaps it wouldn't have ended like this if she hadn't done that. She regrets hurting the protagonist so much at this moment. Someone delivers a strong punch to the driver, and it's clearly the protagonist who appears at the scene. The girl immediately smiles happily, and we can see her favorability increasing by another 40%. They launch themselves at him, but the protagonist, with a graceful move, gives them what they deserve and stands in front of them, suggesting they take the $800 and leave. This ends what happens. However, as the money is about to leave, the protagonist tells her that he doesn't think he can return it, warning that she'll have to pay for what she did to him. Alone and out of danger, she apologizes to the protagonist. However, he tells her that if she really knows she's wrong, she shouldn't bother him in the future. This leaves her sad, realizing she's not good enough for the protagonist at that moment. Still, she decides to use actions to make up for the damage caused over the past three years. Meanwhile, we see her favorability continuing to increase even more. It sometimes holds me back, but nothing happens after that. The protagonist ends up taking a taxi. If you're wondering why, it's because he's going to visit something at his home. However, during the ride, both the protagonist and the driver have some misunderstandings, but nothing serious happens. I won't summarize this part because it's just plot filler. The only important thing is that the protagonist, after spending 300 million, thinks it's boring to schedule meetings one by one. Also, the reserve money can't just be spent like gas. As the protagonist spent 300 million again, he considers spreading the bait everywhere to focus on casting a wide net. However, when the protagonist, who was already at the agreed location with Oyagi, realizes she's not there, he thinks Naninya City is close to the Im Yang University City. Many students go there, and as the main consumers of the stores there are university students, the prices are very affordable. He wonders if she's inviting him to eat there. However, at that moment, the girl opens the door for the protagonist and immediately goes outside. But she ends up pulling the protagonist into her house. Inside, the girl asks the protagonist if he likes what he sees. However, things you see are not asked, but let's not be naughty in our thoughts, as the girl is referring to the house. The protagonist, unaware of this, tells her that he likes it a lot. Sitting down, the girl tells the protagonist to try everything he sees, and she personally made it. The protagonist, upon trying, is impressed because it was delicious, and she never thought she could cook like that, it makes the girl very happy. So she tells the protagonist that she has rented this house for a long time, living there on Saturdays and Sundays when there is no school. She tells the protagonist that he is the first boy to come to her rented house and also the first to eat the food she cooks. This makes the protagonist say that he feels very honored. Looking at some flowers, she asks if they are lilacs on the balcony. This confirms it, telling the protagonist that since he likes the smell of lilacs, she got a vase of them. While the protagonist thinks he has to listen very well to what she is saying, he is not confused but wondering what is happening, as something is wrong with Lugo. There, thinking that since she is not a gold digger, he should find a better way to persuade him to buy. Besides cooking and buying flowers, that's why she puts her hand on his forehead and asks him if everything is okay, if he has a high fever. However, she holds his hand. The protagonist argues to him that she is a very insecure person and that her parents divorced when she was very young, so she felt that the world of people had changed so quickly since she was a child, too much for her to keep up with. Only money could give her the most basic sense of security, but she didn't expect to feel that in the protagonist. Well, she didn't expect to feel security in the protagonist, the security she longed for, telling this protagonist that he pursued the lion for three years, demonstrating that he is a very determined person and spent so much money on her but never asked for anything in return. He is completely different from those guys who are very determined and putting on a provocative pose. The protagonist tells him that even though she has fallen in love several times, she has always been protected. So why wait for him to literally run away? Well, after that, she's waiting for the protagonist to take the next step. However, when it seems they're about to kiss, the protagonist ends up remembering that the guy's favorability rate towards him is 91%. He's starting to fall for him. It's no surprise that she is a completely changed person and just thought she could recover the money after completing the counterattack mission and forgot about it. But if she wants to give herself to him, she won't say no. After all, he's a man, and he'll take advantage of it. And so, the protagonist ends up taking the next step, taking something to bed. However, when the protagonist is about to undress, he hears a voice, a voice the protagonist recognizes as Tom's voice, his friend who was begging him not to leave. The protagonist, perhaps because he's drunk, ends up confirming that John Shone was shouting, 
and they end up slapping him. The person who slapped him, a girl who was asking why he was shouting so loudly if he wasn't ashamed and leaving the place, tells him to keep shouting until everyone knows tomorrow, well, everyone in the school knows. And after the girl leaves, he's just looking for his glasses that fell with the slap. However, at this moment, the protagonist appears, passing his glasses to him, asking him what's going on. The guy responds that unfortunately, the protagonist also knows Nana, whom he's been dating for half a year. Originally, however, before continuing, he is surprised to see Miss Lu and acting alongside the protagonist. The protagonist, faced with this, immediately clarifies the situation, telling him that he invited her to dinner and asks him to continue. And when he's a bit discouraged, he continues telling the protagonist that originally, Nana and he went to the date to watch a movie that day. He picked her up and said he would go to Chanel after the movie to buy an anti-wrinkle collection. And when he saw that it cost more than 8,000, he told her that he didn't have the money at that moment. But not. I expected the girl to get upset and stop watching the movie since everything was fine before, and I don't know why she suddenly got angry. This leads him to ask her if he is the girl's boyfriend or Miss Nana's boyfriend. If he is, he tells him that he heard she really has a rich boyfriend, which makes him tell her it's impossible since Nana couldn't have betrayed him. But she tells the boy that, believe it or not, her news is never wrong, which impresses him, especially since they were beating him until the guy with the curly hair came to help his friend. He tells him to call Miss Nana, his girlfriend, and tell her that he will buy the makeup for her, referring to Miss Luz. She also suggests that he should ask his sister if they saw that man since he wants to see their true faces. Here we can observe how the protagonist told his friend to call his girlfriend and tell her he would buy makeup to place the girl in a specific location. This is because the protagonist wants to see the face of the person his friend has been deceived by, while Mr. F was thoughtful, and the girl accompanying him on the ride asked what was going on. The events unfolded as follows. He replied that perhaps his life would never be the same again, thinking this way because he had almost been expelled from the group. Fortunately, the protagonist spoke in his favor, allowing him to remain in the group. However, now he speaks in the group, and no one listens. If it continues like this, he will surely fall into disgrace. Nevertheless, his thoughts are interrupted by a message that surprises him greatly. But he remains calm as this message is not bad news, it's good news that makes him very happy. He then says, it's your chance to redeem yourself, and presents the message that left him in this state. The message was from the protagonist asking who owns a shopping mall because he would like to borrow it to help one of his colleagues. Of course, you can probably guess that the owner of this shopping mall is Mr. Phoenix, which is why he reacted this way. The next day, Mr. Phoenix, who was in his car, told the lady accompanying him that he would pick up the protagonist that day and discuss the plan. This made the girl ask if he could see the protagonist in person. However, Mr. Phoenix did not respond as he was thoughtful, telling himself that the most important reason he brings the girls is to make it clear to the protagonist that he dares not have irrational thoughts about Au anymore. But when they finally arrive at the agreed location with the protagonist, she asks excitedly, where is the legendary protagonist? He surprises the protagonist as he is dressed like a normal person. This makes her wonder if he's broke, but let's be honest, the protagonist is dressed like a person without money at the moment. However, while the girl wonders about this, Mr. Fendi finds it interesting that even in a simple environment, the protagonist stands out like a Luciana de Escuridao. So he tells her that he spends hundreds of millions but still has a modest breakfast, saying, to him, that's brilliant. This surprises the protagonist a bit, who tells him that he came to this place because it's cheap and delicious, highly recommended. Also, he tells him that they should go to the beach immediately, and the details will be mentioned on the way. While at the beach, it is raining. The protagonist's friend, who was watching his girlfriend from afar, thinks to himself that according to the protagonist's plan, he should first ask his girlfriend to wait at the door. Then, Lava's sister will deceive the man to go there as well. So he will wait to see if they meet and if they are really a couple. However, his suspicions are confirmed as he sees his girlfriend kissing another man. This makes him furious, and he approaches her to ask how she dares to betray him as a mature man. However, he realizes that the other man is the legendary one who was already heading towards the girl and ended up intervening to ask him if he was the poor boyfriend that Miss Nana had talked about. The friend. The protagonist decides not to answer the question, so I ask him to get out of the way since this is between him and his girlfriend. This prompts the chubby guy to ask him if he's going to use something to remove him from the path, saying that if he plans to do that, he should know that it might not end well for him. To emphasize his point, he calls security to report that a man is causing trouble there, 
interfering with his shopping experience. This leads the protagonist's friend to tell him to leave the premises. In a trembling voice, the friend insists that he's not causing any trouble and is just talking to his girlfriend. However, the girl interrupts to tell him not to talk nonsense since the gentleman is her boyfriend, not him. This leaves him indignant, and he asks her why she's doing this, stating that their six-month relationship can't be compared to this man who appeared out of nowhere. Nevertheless, the girl asks him if he doesn't understand that when security sees them, Mr. Chu is a VIP millionaire customer of this shopping mall. This type of treatment is also received by her. Additionally, she asks him how he can be her boyfriend, how he can endure the difficulties, saying that everyone has to think about their own future. The chubby guy also tells him that he should think about making money instead of having a girlfriend so that he can find a 20-year-old girlfriend when he is 40. However, at the location, Mr. FIM ends up appearing and the chubby guy recognizes him just by looking at his car, as he told us that he is the youngest son of the owner of the Meridia Hotel and also the owner of the Jim Vi Plaza. Furthermore, he has already done many business deals with him, which surprises the girl because, to her, the chubby guy is amazing. However, they believe that Mr. FIA would greet the chubby guy, but he just walked past him and went to hug the protagonist's friend to ask if he is there to impress the downtown foundation saying that he hopes he reconsiders this investment since they have two other malls to develop. This leaves the chubby guy with more questions than answers, but as he processes everything, he realizes that they are impressed because they wonder how he invested in the floor. However, the girl who was with Mr. FIA approaches the protagonist's friend to tell him that she promised to buy him a purse, which makes her ask how Shodom can be so rich, saying that he can spend thousands of dollars on makeup. This makes the red-haired girl ask her if Mr. Sho's money is worth it. However, while the girls were debating, Shodam notices the protagonist, and here he realizes that it was the protagonist who called two people to help him. Therefore, more confident in adopting a firm posture, he says that he originally was inspecting the mall, but the nasty behavior of this man affected his inspection experience and also seemed to suggest that he was a VIP millionaire or something like that. This makes Mr. Sim ask if this guy is the millionaire VIP of the mall, saying that this man was just tearing apart his entire mall. Therefore, he ends up calling security to tell him to cancel the VIP and the crazy guy because he owes two million for breaking the contract. This makes the chubby guy accept what is happening and it is clear that Mr. FIM is very upset because of this woman and that he does not want to lose a large part of his construction material business because of her. As he does not want that, he tells Mr. Sho that everything is a misunderstanding because he really did not know, and therefore, he apologizes to him, saying that he treated it like a fool and let it go, but he smiles. On the simple face, he simply said that it is strong and good, and it turns out that it is serious, which is a defensive thing, the same as understanding what it means. Therefore, he tells the manager who was there that he should also include the faces of these two people since he should blacklist them and never allow them to enter the square again. This is something that makes these two think they shouldn't do it, however, the protagonist with a cold look made the chubby one, who is so old that he might not be able to get up after a fall. The girl, seeing that everything is going from bad to worse, asks the chubby one what they are going to do now. Enraged, he tells her that his construction materials company is famous from now on, and although he doesn't cooperate with the man, he still has many contacts. Therefore, he asks her to leave. However, when they were about to leave, many sports cars end up stopping in front, which surprises the chubby one because he knows very well that all these sports cars belong to the second. Rich and young generation, so he wonders why everyone is there, but the answer is obvious since they are all there because of the protagonist's friend. Because the protagonist asked for help from everyone, upon seeing so many wealthy young people gathered in one place, and they are there to see the big show, he can't resist and ends up giving something. However, in the face of so much help offered to him, the protagonist's friend ends up thanking. However, the protagonist tells him not to thank because, as his friend, he had to help him. But even though the protagonist helped him, he has a doubt, so he asks the protagonist how he knows so many rich acquaintances. The protagonist explains to his friend that it's not like that, saying that they are contacts the Lord has in his work environment, which is very broad and includes group performances and other things. But even though the protagonist did not tell the truth to his friend, he ended up believing in his words. After thanking, the protagonist's friend leaves, but the girl who was watching from afar stays. Seeing the protagonist, she becomes pensive. However, before they could explain what she was thinking, 
the protagonist interrupts to thank her, suggesting that she might want to invite everyone for a hot meal. As the protagonist's proposal is not bad, everyone agrees, and the lord comes to say that they should go to the subar on the seventh floor of the mall, something everyone accepts, including the protagonist, who thought he had never been to such a luxurious place. Therefore, the protagonist wonders if it's not too expensive, but of course, he has no right to ask that. After that, they go to the Silver Moon Hotel, and all the wealthy young people were already gathered there. One of the wealthy young men there comments that the protagonist gave 100 million to each of three stars the day before, so in just one day, the number of beautiful girls registered on the entire platform double. This makes one of them say that the protagonist feels like a poor man, causing others to suspect that the protagonist is the son of one of the most invisible tycoons in the capital. While they are discussing this, one of them asks the girl next to him why she is so silent and continues drinking alcohol, saying that he believes the reason she is like that. However, he would like to help her, but the project he proposes is not only expensive but also crazy. Not even the top leader of Chinese technology could solve it, asking how a small team created less than a year ago could solve it. Furthermore, why is she so determined to start her own project? If the protagonist didn't give you more than 10 million in the group last time and he spent it so quickly while he warns the protagonist that don't listen because he's plotting something scandalous and anyone who gets involved in this game will lose everything however the same for being chattering the girl ends up sending the protagonist to heaven facing this he tells her that she is the treasure of the group asking where he should spend his stomach. While we can observe the system sending a message to the protagonist saying that he must start the counterattack mission further Furthermore we can observe that her favorability is more than 10 which makes the protagonist think that he cannot let the opportunity to get a girl and make money pass the girl continues to explain to the protagonist that she is in the business of making industrial chips which makes the protagonist tell her that it is outrageous stupid. Since only a stupid dream however Miss Jean tells him that there is nothing stupid about it and academically possible telling him that his company has been working on this project for over a year and only needs to solve some minor technical problems approach the protagonist she asks him what do you think about investing in your project this while well, he thought that anyway the protagonist would probably go for all this like everyone else however it is exactly the opposite since the protagonist tells her that industrial chips are genius in New York they are ahead of the technology of his country and if this chip could be developed in the country it will have more chances to compete with the Americans therefore the protagonist tells her to accept the investment in her project which impresses her since the protagonist agreed to the project which for her is complete madness facing this the girl asks the prota if he agrees to get married asking if he won't research her company first since it is a great possibility that it will not work which seems not to matter to the prota since he tells her that there is no need for any investigation saying that first he will transfer the money and then he can send the contract furthermore he tells her that he transferred 500 million and when that runs out she should ask for more money and she should also worry if it doesn't work because there is no problem since the protagonist likes to support entrepreneurship since the protagonist enjoys supporting entrepreneurship he tells her that he doesn't know why but she seems trustworthy or much less deceiving than everyone else present as she is the only person taking his ideas seriously. He says this or asks if he is mistaken. However, in response, the girl does not answer the protagonist. Instead, while looking at her phone, she receives a message stating that she has received 500 million in her account. Surprised, she looks at the protagonist and says, well, she says that, and the protagonist truly believes her. Meanwhile, we can observe how her favorability increases by another 20%. The protagonist is surprised that she invested so much money in such a project, and people say that this money will probably be lost. Therefore, as this is not normal, they ask if the protagonist fell in love with Miss Young and bought her smile with money. However, this is far from the truth. The protagonist says goodbye as he has unfinished business, leaving the girl impressed. Although he invested money, he didn't give it much importance. But something happened when the protagonist left, everyone started to argue because he forgot to pay the bill. None of them wanted to pay, but the protagonist thought differently, stating that it was too expensive, and he couldn't afford to pay. He said he didn't feel like inviting them. After some time passes, we transition to Miss Jean's house, who was exercising and talking on the phone. She expresses surprise as she received an investment, affirming that she still can't believe it. Here, we meet the person on the other end of the call who congratulates her for solving the biggest financial problem on her business trip. Miss Jean confirms this and recalls how her father opposed her business to the point of blocking all her cards. Due to this, 
she had no choice but to borrow from relatives who refused to help, as her father had informed everyone about her situation. Back in the present, she is motivated to move forward, and the person on the other end of the call supports her decision, saying that they believe in her. Miss Jean then tells the person with blue skin that they are just talking about themselves. The blue-skinned person asks her about the meeting, and she explains that it was supposed to be a regular party. However, one of her colleagues surprised everyone with their knowledge of relic evaluation, comparable to their masters. If the blue-skinned nickname is referring to the protagonist, Miss Jean is a bit surprised and asks if she is really interested in a guy. Since it doesn't happen every day, Blue was interrupted by her mother, who told her it was time to leave. Before leaving, her mother reminded Blue that Mr. Chow represented the Chow family, which would become the curator of their museum in the future. Blue reluctantly agreed, but didn't seem happy with this decision. The story then shifted to the protagonist, who was arriving at the dormitories. Upon entering, he noticed that his friend was sick. He asked what was happening, and his friend explained that he had a fever and asked the protagonist to cover his shift at work that night. He agreed to do it for $50, as he had nothing else to do. While looking for a uniform, the protagonist realized that Gut worked the night shift at the museum seven nights a week, and Zotam couldn't replace him due to Gut's fear of the dark. Therefore, he found himself obliged to help his friend. Leaving the place, the protagonist told his roommate that he was going to work, and he should rest. His friend supported him, saying he should go out once and for all and visit a museum. Facing the museum, the protagonist, who was already there, replaced his friend and noticed that there was no one in the museum that day. He checked his phone and wondered why not spend some money on enjoyment. While the protagonist was spending his money, a car appeared, and two people got out. It seemed that the man who got out of the car was Mr. Chow, who asked the museum guide to accompany him. The guide pointed the way, but the protagonist was distracted by his phone, which Mr. Chow noticed. He asked the guide if they had hired a blind person to work at the museum since the protagonist didn't even stand up to greet him. The protagonist finally stood up, apologized, and welcomed them. Mr. Chow asked if the protagonist was a university student working temporarily at the museum, which surprised the guy. She commented that the protagonist seemed more suited to be a security guard. Mr. Chow agreed and mentioned that the protagonist's excuse seemed sincere. The protagonist replied that in school, he learned not to judge people by their appearance, not to judge a book by its cover. Mr. Chow was impressed with this response but still dissatisfied. He asked if the protagonist planned to give him lessons. The protagonist denied it and said that he, too, was an enthusiast like Mr. Chow. Offended by the protagonist's disrespect, Mr. Chow asked the guide not to want to see him at the museum from the next day. However, the guide explained that they needed staff and would continue working together. Mr. Chow became furious and told the guide to shut up, questioning who the protagonist thought he was. He insisted that the protagonist be removed immediately. The protagonist agreed with Mr. Chow and followed him down the path as the director was waiting. While observing from a distance, the protagonist noticed that the guide mentioned the director's name, Jay making him think that the museum belonged to the John family, i.e., Blue's family. Therefore, he decided to go in and talk to her. On the second floor, Mr. Chow was welcomed by the director, who greeted him and shook his hand, expressing happiness that he wanted to contribute to the preservation of history, and his family was delighted with calling her Blue, he told her that she should show him the museum, which she accepted. However, as Blue passed by him, her father. The investment of Mr. Chow is very important, and they rely on him for it to be a success. With that said, by the blue law, Mr. Chow is told that he needs it because it will showcase the treasures of his museum. Upon encountering a painting, Blue states that it's the only one with the handwriting of the god of poetry and unique in its genre. The 200-word poem speaks of the sorrow of parting from a friend, and if you look closely at the image, you can feel the poet's emotions while writing the poem. However, it becomes evident that Mr. Chow is not interested in the paintings but in the girl. She immediately notices this, removes his hand, and questions what he is doing. He apologizes, stating that she is so beautiful that he can't help. The girl realizes he's not interested in the artifacts and asks why he invested in the museum. He replies that he spent his money on what he wanted. She becomes upset, commenting that if he knew more about the subject, he'd realize the artifacts aren't worth the cost. She questions why her father would accept such an investment. He reveals that she has a unique quality no other woman has, and he likes it. He claims he'll show her the real world offering to buy the museum for $600 million with the condition that she marries him. Her father thinks it's too much, 
and she declares she'll never marry him. She asks her father to send him away, but he's considering the 600 million. He reveals the truth. After two consecutive years, the Eel Museum can't function and is on the brink of destruction. Mr. Chow isn't there to invest but to buy the museum. The girl is shocked, asking her father what he said. Mr. Chow approaches, claiming he's the last hope to save them from bankruptcy. He reassures the father that his daughter will have a better life if she marries him. The girl turns to her mother, questioning if she should sell herself to this man. The mother apologizes, claiming she's worthless and leaves the decision in her hands. The father adds that he didn't want to marry her off this way, but if they don't sell the museum, they'll go bankrupt. The father continues, stating that most of these artifacts are bought by distributors and collectors with low profits or end up on the black market, leaving the girl conflicted. She remembers telling her father when she was little that their artifacts were precious, and she could see who made them. She disagrees with people who buy or sell artifacts on the black market, thinking that the rich don't value them and only care about making money. She thought there were things money couldn't buy, but facing reality, she realizes everything is fragile. Mr. Chow, seeing the pensive girl, assures her that he'll be good to her after the marriage. He promises to buy another museum if she gives him a child. The girl, realizing she has no other option, reluctantly accepts. She informs everyone that she understands what is happening and accepts. Her father praises her growth and pride, urging her to sign the contract. After a while, the contract and guide are brought in. The guide states that the agreement will take effect after both parties sign and cannot be altered. The girl's father has no issue with this, as Mr. Chow is very generous. Mr. Chow assures the mother that her daughter will be happy marrying him. Having no other choice, the girl signs the contract. Pen in hand, ready to sign something he seems very happy or eager to happen. However, the girl clearly doesn't want to sign at all, as she can be seen with tears in her eyes. Nevertheless, they end up listening to the gods, as when she was about to sign, the protagonist appears on the scene asking about someone buying the museum. Clearly, everyone is surprised by this, but the most surprised to see the protagonist is Ape Le Azul, the cable officer. He is surprised to talk to the protagonist, but due to their differences, he immediately calls security to remove the protagonist from there. However, the protagonist tells the cable officer that he works as a security guard at the museum during the night. The protagonist is the one who holds that position, making the cable officer very angry. He tries to kick him, but the protagonist defends himself by slapping him. The cable officer receives what he deserves from the ground, asking the protagonist how he dares to hit him, threatening to make him lose his job and sue him. However, the protagonist pays no attention to his words and simply approaches Ape Le Azul to wipe away her tears, leaving her very embarrassed. Her father is a bit confused and asks his daughter if she knows the protagonist, to which she replies that his name is Lingerie and that he was her classmate. This makes the father ask why a boy her age should focus on his studies and not become a security guard like the protagonist. Not understanding what is happening, the protagonist will let it go but will have to apologize to the cable officer and pay for what he did. However, while the father and daughter talk, the protagonist reads the contract and breaks it, surprising everyone. Grabbing the contract, the cable officer asks the protagonist what he did, but the protagonist did it for a reason, he offers a billion dollars for the museum. This makes the cable officer mock the protagonist, saying he is talking nonsense and asking how a simple security guard can have so much money. He says that if he really buys it, he'll eat his hat. However, the protagonist rejects it, saying that the last person who said that lost and didn't fulfill his promise. The parents of Ape Le Azul, upon hearing the protagonist's off, are surprised and ask her if the protagonist is rich. However, the girl apparently knows nothing about the protagonist and tells her parents that she doesn't know if he is rich. On the other hand, the cable officer calls 15 people to tell them that there is an idiot at the museum causing trouble and tells them to bring some people there to teach the protagonist a lesson. While the cable officer was talking, Ape Le Azul wonders what the protagonist is doing there since he shouldn't be there. However, Ape Le Azul's father approaches the protagonist and tells him that obviously, the protagonist is there for his daughter and that he won't say anything. He says that if the protagonist can guarantee a billion dollars, the first payment should be for Pedro, the floor consisting of just four words, buy it for my daughter. However, the cable officer, seeing the protagonist holding the contract, 
tells him not to do it because he can say he doesn't have money and leave. However, the protagonist once again ignores his words while reading the contract and feels bad because he is about to treat the girl as an object and all of this seems very strange and disturbing, and this only happens to him. However, looking at the artifact that the girl was showing to the cable officer earlier, he realizes the great significance it has. In fact, it has a great poem written on it that says, the setting sun stretches over the withered willows only for a gentle wind, and the shadow is soaked with tears. Approaching the cable officer, he realizes that the artifact has great power, leaving everyone confused, or rather, they don't understand what the protagonist is doing. However, they are surprised when the protagonist mentions that he wants to change the contract, and as the protagonist wants to change the contract, he, the protagonist approaches someone to ask them to do this quickly, the guide apologizes but cannot change the contract. Meanwhile, the father of the girl with blue eyes tells the protagonist not to dare to pay a penny less. However, the protagonist insists that he only wants to spend those billions to buy the museum, and the artifacts are not included in the cost. He mentions that these paintings, calligraphy, and artifacts stored in the museum are priceless and cannot be measured in money, so they still belong to the family. Approaching the girl with blue eyes, he tells her to have respect and genuinely loves these artifacts. Therefore, the right to use the museum and eliminate the artifacts should belong to the girl with blue eyes. Additionally, he states that he will be the largest shareholder with the absolute right to make decisions, and the girl with blue eyes will be the owner of the Anian Museum. He signs the contract in her name with a charming smile, telling her that if she needs money for the museum or has any personal problems, she should call him. This increases her favorability by another 20%. However, when the protagonist swipes his credit card, he succeeds, and it shows how the protagonist spent billions, leaving everyone astonished, wondering how rich the protagonist must be. Only Mr. Chow is terrified, thinking about how the protagonist can spend billions like that. Another person, a blue-eyed girl who was visiting, approaches the protagonist and asks why he did it. The protagonist smiles and says that he will buy all the remaining artifacts in China, emphasizing that these artifacts are treasures belonging to the Chinese people. Mr. Chow overhears this and mentions that the protagonist just bought a museum with a complete collection worth over $500 million, and he talks about bringing back artifacts from around the world. He suggests that if the protagonist is so interested, he should attend the auction in Japan next month, where there are paintings of miles of mountains and rivers, crystal statues of the goddess of mercy, each worth over a billion dollars. He proposes that the protagonist go and try to buy everything there instead of just talking about it. The protagonist agrees and says he will definitely go to the auction outside the museum. The protagonist's assistant asks Mr. Chow if there will be trouble for the protagonist, but Mr. Chow denies it and says he only wants to cause conflict. At this moment, Mr. Chow receives a call asking about the museum purchase. He mentions that it's the first step in the East Asian artifact collection project of Gran Comita. He leaked but they shouldn't lose sight of the protagonist. However, Mr. Chow assures that everything is going well at first, but suddenly a Chinese idiot appeared out of nowhere and bought the museum. Still, he says not to worry because he managed to get the protagonist to attend the auction next month and there will be an opportunity to apologize in person. Finally, they mention that after signing the contract, the protagonist became the largest and sole shareholder of the Anian Museum. Both the father and mother of the blue-eyed girl thank the protagonist and invite him for a meal in gratitude. However, the protagonist declines, saying he's on the night shift and not hungry. This increases his favorability by another 10%. As the protagonist leaves, the blue-eyed girl's father asks if he's really going to Japan next month, and the protagonist confirms that she will accompany him when the time comes. This is when we see that the blue-haired character has begun to show interest in the protagonist after he bought a museum and made her the owner. Thanks to all this, we see his popularity increase even more. However, the next day, the protagonist, who was going to class, tells us that he was on duty at the museum the night before, and the blue-haired girl talked to him until midnight. But when he least expected it, she involuntarily fell asleep, and now he will have to sit with her since she didn't complete the sentence. The protagonist couldn't consume anything last night, as both the light and act of the protagonist's ex-girlfriend noticed it. They approached him to ask what was happening, expressing concern. The protagonist, feeling their worry, explained that lack of sleep is not good and suggested they go home and rest. However, the protagonist's current girlfriend, slightly jealous, 
questioned him and suggested he sit next to her in class in a seductive manner. She proposed he could lay his head on her lap to listen and rest at the same time. The protagonist rejected this proposal, asking why she was clinging to him again, questioning if she didn't remember what she had said before. Before the protagonist could finish his sentence, she interrupted, stating that she remembers everything but can't help being deeply in love with him. She doesn't care if he's rich or not, she just wants to start over. Showing a crane, presumably a gesture of sincerity, she tells him to appreciate and correct his past mistakes. The protagonist thinks to himself that she has made 999 of these cranes before but discarded them, so she must have been upset about it. However, the crane she made with her own hands will touch his heart this time. Meanwhile, her popularity increases to over 86%. The protagonist realizes she is lying because, to him, 86% is not equal to 100%. He knows she is not completely in love. He thinks his ex-girlfriend is not the type to be moved by kindness. Otherwise, she wouldn't have left him for Alfonso. She clings to him because she feels very alone. As the protagonist leaves, the rivalry intensifies, with the current girlfriend believing she's gaining ground and the ex-girlfriend clearly upset. After class, the girls still cling to the protagonist. Luz and Act suggest he can go to her apartment and sleep there without any issues. The ex-girlfriend interrupts, telling her that he's not her boyfriend, so it's not appropriate to invite him to her house. Despite the discussion, the protagonist asks them to stop dragging him, as he doesn't want to become famous for it. Suddenly, a car appears out of nowhere and takes him away. The protagonist finds himself sitting on someone's lap, surprised by the unexpected situation. He asks if it was Miss Sasha who took him, and she inquires if he's injured. Surprised by her presence, the protagonist requests to get up, but Miss Sasha tells him to take his time and rest for a bit, which he gladly accepts, thanking her for arriving just in time. She mentions it as gratitude for all his donations. The protagonist agrees, considering it fair. Meanwhile, Miss A observes them and wonders who the girl is that the protagonist took in front of everyone. People mention it's a Ferrari LF worth around $30 million. Some wonder how the protagonist, seemingly an ordinary person, managed to get such a car. The boy managed to win over this rich girl while others believe that she must also be rich and famous. However, they are all wrong. Snow, the protagonist, becomes upset hearing the comments from other guys, knowing that other rich girls will probably approach him now that they know he is wealth. Acting on this realization, she mocks him, recalling that she used to ignore him before but can't anymore. Snow believes that Aguirre is just boasting and doesn't believe her. However, she remembers that the protagonist is simple and wonders how long he will withstand such harassment. She takes a firm stance, declaring that the protagonist is her ex-boyfriend and belongs only to her. Her popularity increases even more with this statement. Meanwhile, the protagonist receives many notifications from the system, informing him that Lu's favorability level has increased to over 90%, triggering a hiring level. He is surprised and asks what is happening. The system informs him that 800,000 units of the game's currency were spent on his girlfriends, and 10% of that amount was transferred to his personal account. The protagonist is surprised by this. Before he can process it all, the system sends another notification, stating that his rewards have increased in all current level statistics. His strength, endurance, and dexterity have increased, leaving him very satisfied. Additionally, he gets the opportunity to choose three additional Class B skills, long-distance running, swimming mastery, and dance mastery. The protagonist finds long-distance running skills useless and chooses swimming mastery. He quickly feels his brain filling instantly with knowledge about swimming, and his chest, back, and arm muscles strengthen. However, while he is thinking about this, both he and Miss Sasha are being observed by a man who was alerted by his assistant that they were ready for a meeting. After this meeting, we can see how everyone present is debating the protagonist's situation, as he broke some rules and is therefore angry. By the way, he is the president who claims that Janssen University is known for its excellent learning environment and spirit. Two other girls just started a mess on the campus, complicating their relationship. His new girlfriend began running across the campus at full speed, and now everyone knows about it. The protagonist surprises this man, Mr. Chuck, who asks if these boys are not from the literature department. The boy's name is Linger, our protagonist. The president tells him that the previous student council president always praised him and said that the literature department man is a serious and responsible person. However, 
He also reprimands the protagonist for his unacceptable behavior and promises to take immediate action to punish him. The protagonist responds that the student council should support all university students, admit their mistakes, and promise not to break the rules again. The next day, the protagonist is accompanied by one of his colleagues, who says that the student council really went too far, forcing him to clean the pool throughout the semester. However, the protagonist doesn't seem upset. He explains that rules exist for the safety and well-being of everyone in the university community. While he was cleaning the pool, some girls began to notice his growing popularity. As he saw this happening, he thought that the protagonist was just another conqueror. However, as soon as he finished that thought, she felt a cramp and wondered how it was possible since she had warmed up well before starting. She started sinking in the pool, thinking she was about to drown. However, the others noticed, and the protagonist realized that she was in danger. Without hesitation, he threw himself in her direction, and the most surprising thing was not only his readiness to perceive the danger and act but also his professional swimming ability. The protagonist reached the girl, who, upon seeing him touch her, said that luck had told her it wasn't luck. However, the protagonist did the same, telling her to calm down and breathe, thus asking her to. The girl, do not move, for it will lead you to love. However, the girl, upon seeing the protagonist Nadal, is surprised by him because he could swim so fast, even holding her with a single hand. But now, at this moment, he doesn't give her much importance, remembering the protagonist's name. She thinks to herself that she has never been so close to a boy before. However, when the protagonist takes the girl to the shore in the most careful way possible, he tells her to be more careful next time. With this action, the protagonist has planted his seeds in the girl. But like the protagonist's lasagna, it was incredible and magnificent. The people who were there, looking at the protagonist, said he is very cool and fast, as he had just broken a new record. They say they have the whole video and want to publish it on the internet. Passing by the brown girl who was surprised by what the protagonist just did, looking at her friend, she tells her that the protagonist is the guy she called boring and seems to be a good person. He even saved her life, and he is very fast. So, she asks her if he wouldn't be suitable for her. Remember that her friend asks this because she said she was looking for a guy faster than her. Without further ado, we can see how she reacts upon hearing the protagonist's name. Her pulse accelerates, which makes her friend ask her why her face is so red. Another person who noticed this was the previous guy, the one who is in love with her, who also realized that the girl is in love with the protagonist. But besides all this, here they present us how someone posted the video in which the protagonist rescued the girl. Apparently, this video became famous simply because the protagonist is very fast, and when I say fast, he is really fast, as he even broke the record that existed. However, someone who was not satisfied with the protagonist's impact is the president, who angrily says that he will definitely destroy him. The truth is that it is not clear why he feels this way, as he seems to have a hatred for the protagonist. The next day at the student party, someone argues that the student party was organized by the student council and that there will be a big mysterious prize. The student council decided to invest a lot in this occasion. Also, as the students were there, let me tell you that both were really handsome. However, Lucy tells the protagonist's ex-boyfriend that she looks very beautiful that day, but it's a pity that the protagonist is not paying attention to her because he is very well dressed. However, instead of getting upset with her, he thanks her for the compliment and says he hopes she enjoys the night to the fullest because everything will change after that night. These words make her think that the protagonist's ex-girlfriend is plotting something. However, she doesn't care much about it because she says it's better to forget it since she first needs to cut a steak for the protagonist, and when he arrives, they will eat immediately. They will definitely dance together that night. However, the protagonist's ex-girlfriend doesn't think the same way because she thinks Lucy always strives to play the role of the smart, kind girl and wonders if Lucy really thinks no one notices. She then says that Lucy really thinks she can control guys with her tricks, but before. She says it's an obstacle that needs to be removed, and this obstacle is the pink girl who is wondering where the protagonist is, as she wants to see him again and thank him. If it weren't for the protagonist, she would probably be dead. However, before she finishes her thoughts, she is interrupted by the protagonist's boyfriend, who tells me that he is delighted to meet her. He thinks that this girl is probably thinking of getting close to the protagonist just because he saved her from the accident. However, as Lucy does not know the protagonist's ex-girlfriend, she asks who she is. The girl introduces herself as Lucy, 
the protagonist's girlfriend, and asks if a new video is talking about her. She then says that her boyfriend has always been very responsible and kind, frequently helping people, and the protagonist pursued her for three years before she finally accepted to be his girlfriend. Laughing, she asks if Lucy knows why she's saying this and then says, in the end, they are happy together. She approaches Lucy, saying that she hopes they enjoy the night anyway. He wanted to thank the protagonist, but it's not necessary, as the protagonist will be busy tonight because he has a date. Putting on a Santa mask, she asks if he understands, to which he responds affirmatively. While staying in place, she shouts again that he understood, and the protagonist's boyfriend, realizing that he managed to distance the girl from the protagonist, says that he has no chance against her. This happens while we can observe how her popularity increases, giving her a popularity rating of 91%. The protagonist is surprised to see that Amenta's popularity has increased, and he wonders how this happened so quickly since he didn't do anything. Now he's just playing, however, the protagonist's thoughts are interrupted by a man who says the ball is about to start and asks why he isn't ready. The protagonist responds that he's supposed to be cleaning now and complains about the council because it's always his class that has to do such stupid things. Furthermore, there's this president who seems to have something against him. After that, the protagonist, who was on his way to the student ball, thinks to himself that the student council president is a trickster because he always used his position to make his life worse, or actually his life is made up of Wednesdays for those who can't stand it. Even his friend China seems to have suffered because of him. However, the protagonist doesn't see it as a challenge but rather as something interesting. He thinks he should get to know him someday. At this moment, the protagonist receives a message from the delegate telling him to go to the ball because the president wants to give him an award at the ceremony to honor him for saving someone. The president asks the protagonist to hurry because everyone is waiting for him. The protagonist agrees and agrees to be there shortly. However, he wonders why an award ceremony seems more like a party than anything else. Additionally, the protagonist says that if they are not attacked, he will not attack. But now that Guincho has taken his first step, the protagonist says he will have fun with him tonight even if he is a bit strange. As the protagonist is walking calmly, he notices that he is being watched by a man who is the uncle infatuated with the red-haired girl holding a brick. He stole his glory, so the protagonist didn't want to, and so he decided to break the protagonist's legs. However, the protagonist easily dodged with a quick move, grabbed the boy by the head, and threw him to the ground, giving him a strong blow. After defending himself, the protagonist remembered that this guy was Rose's classmate, so he asked why the boy attacked, and the protagonist said he was just asking if he was going to hurt his face since the boy had stolen his fame and his girlfriend. The protagonist asked who the girl was, and the clearly disturbed boy said she was just anybody because he had been chasing her for a long time, but she didn't even notice. Now he was the protagonist whom she didn't even remember the name of. Seeing them together, she healed, and the boy cursed, calling her stupid with great attributes before he could do anything else. The protagonist hit him with a powerful kick to the face and sent him where he deserved, saying that trash should go to the trash. At the party, we saw how the protagonist acted surprised to see someone whose love interest was the protagonist immediately, and she approached him and said the protagonist had finally arrived. The protagonist said he had heard of an interesting award ceremony, and Jia asked what the award ceremony was, and the protagonist said they preferred to dance since they were waiting for it. The protagonist accepted the proposal and without thinking, both took the girl to dance and showed their incredible dancing skills. If you're wondering why the protagonist is so good at dancing, it's because he honed all his skills, and this brought many benefits. After the dance, one of the girls at the party approached the protagonist to praise him for his amazing dancing ability. However, before she could say anything else, Agir interrupted, saying that for the next person to dance with the protagonist, she could wait outside. This left the girl breathless, and she suggested he rest, although Agir was defending the protagonist. She thought he couldn't fully defend him because. Many girls approached the protagonist to invite him to dance, which made the other boys at the party jealous of the protagonist. One of them asked if the protagonist was just a famous flatterer, questioning why all these girls were suddenly after him. It was when the student council president said he was going to give an award to him, they wondered if the protagonist deserved it. Another colleague said the student council president knew what he was doing, a good person. However, 
he ended up appearing to tell the boys who were speaking ill of the protagonist that they shouldn't say that since the protagonist really saved someone by approaching him and offering something. The protagonist says his university needs students like him to be role models on behalf of the student council and all the students. They would like to toast to him, however, before drinking, the protagonist stares at it for a moment. Upon this, the president asks the protagonist what's going on, saying that if he's going to refuse the toast from the president. The protagonist ends up apologizing to the president, who accepts the drink, questioning his own manners since the protagonist could refuse the president's toast. Then he ends up drinking accidentally what he wanted the protagonist to do. However, after the protagonist drinks the drink, the president says he would like to talk to him about the student council and asks the protagonist to follow him. The protagonist accepts, and upon arriving at the meeting room, someone notices a pink-haired girl lying on a couch. As he approaches her, the protagonist says the girl seems to have a fever, however, upon touching her, the protagonist also feels dizzy for some reason and ends up fainting on top of the girl. Here we can see how all of this was a plan by the president who with a camera transmitted that this was excellent since the video camera was working, and everything was ready for his plan. He leaves saying that the protagonist will be able to take advantage of it this time by going to the main center. The people there wonder if the award ceremony shouldn't have started yet and why it hasn't started. Meanwhile, the president calms everyone down, saying they shouldn't be so impatient since the protagonist will be there soon. He thinks that what he gave to the protagonist should have already taken effect, not even an elephant can resist that, and much less a protagonist. He confidently says that the protagonist wants to make his speech on the screen so everyone should look at him. Everyone should look at the big screen, saying to greet the protagonist. However, when the big screen comes, everyone is surprised because the protagonist is in suggestive people, or rather, he is doing adult things. The president, pretending to be dead, tells the protagonist that this is a live broadcast and he knows the protagonist loves to be the center of attention, but he can't do something like that. This makes everyone, absolutely everyone, turn against the protagonist, saying they should go to the meeting room since that is disgusting. Moreover, they say they should kick the protagonist out of school since the University of Angie will not tolerate shamelessness like the protagonist, and everyone agrees, deciding to expel him. This makes the president smirk maliciously to himself, thinking, so this is the true power, the power of the student council president, and this is the satisfaction of crushing this pathetic ant. However, his smile doesn't last long because someone appears asking if he lost something. The president becomes speechless upon seeing who it is. If the protagonist just left the room, he asks why so much commotion, saying, so who are you going to expel from the university? The glory and beauty should have been for him, but the protagonist appeared out of nowhere and stole his glory. After the protagonist suddenly appeared, the president was surprised. The protagonist noticed the president's reaction and asked why he was so scared to see the president impressed upon seeing the protagonist, he asked who was in the room since the protagonist was there. The protagonist replied that how could he know since the president was the one who organized the program. As they talked, the audience began to murmur. The surprise was that the person on the big screen was not the protagonist but the guy the protagonist had beaten up and thrown into the trash previously. However, going back 10 minutes, the system informed the protagonist that the effect of an aphrodisiac had been discovered, his third level passive ability was activated, allowing poisons. A moment later, the system informed the protagonist that the aphrodisiac's effect had disappeared, and the recovery time for the passive ability was 12 hours. After the aphrodisiac's effect disappeared, the protagonist realized that the girl was defenseless in front of the installed cameras and a closed door. Faced with the third level power, the door was like a piece of paper. Additionally, the protagonist had been sedated with a powerful sedative. He decided to leave the girl in the women's bathroom, hoping his assistants would find her there. Unable to find the protagonist, he went to the guy he had beaten up and took him to the room, giving him a drink containing aphrodisia. The protagonist mentioned that the president had worked hard to organize such a magnificent performance and questioned how he could allow his careful plans to be ruined. Additionally, in the dressing room, there were plastic models and wigs that the protagonist used to deceive the president into believing he was still present while the president was impressed with what he saw. The protagonist commented that the president was really sick to do that. The guy then took off his clothes and began to behave inappropriately with a girl. The shocked president told the protagonist that this couldn't be true because he heard him fall onto the will. However, upon realizing what he said, the president immediately covered his mouth. The protagonist, like everyone else, 
heard what the president said. The protagonist asked the president if he wanted to tell the truth to everyone. While everyone was impressed, the protagonist continued to tell the president that he needed to tell the truth not only to him but to everyone in the room, asking exactly how he saw him fall, approaching him closely and looking at him threatening. The protagonist tells the president that he was talking incessantly just a while ago, but now suddenly lost the gift of speech. However, as the protagonist says this to the president, we can observe a person approaching. Them. This person asks the protagonist what the hell he's doing and pointing to the protagonist, tells him that he's not even an active student but dares to openly question the president. The protagonist, who is also a student, does not find this reasonable. So it's not surprising that the president thinks he's the type of person who doesn't want to succeed before that. The protagonist asks the professor if everything is all right, telling him that even if everything he said was true, it can't change the fact that the president said he saw him fall on her and on the will, asking him how he could go back on that now. However, Professor Einstein, in defense of the president, tells the protagonist that the president works very hard and is dedicated to the cause, he even organizes award ceremonies for people like him. While pointing to the protagonist, he continues telling him that not only did he decide not to do the program but he also didn't speak at the con room. Instead, he put the president in an uncomfortable situation with his views and ruined the spirit of the university. Therefore, the protagonist should be punished with a disciplinary sanction to restore a great environment for teachers and students. However, after saying this, we see two people looking at each other, seeming to be planning something. These people begin to say that if the protagonist committing such a serious offense will only be punished, they will not accept it because he is not worthy of the president's favor. While the other also supports his colleague, saying that the protagonist should be expelled from the university immediately. This causes everyone to agree that the protagonist should be expelled literally. Everyone was in agreement with this idea except an act who tried to make everyone reconsider by questioning ego, asking what was happening since it is clear that the president was the one who organized everything against the protagonist. However, while she was saying this, no one listened to her because they were against the protagonist in this matter. The president, who won the battle once again, confesses to the protagonist that he bribed Professor Juno, all the students in the room, and the student council. He asks the protagonist how he can compete with him now. However, while he was saying all this to the protagonist, the protagonist looks at him Leo which makes the president tell everyone that the protagonist wants to escape, telling them that they had to catch the protagonist immediately. He literally said this to the disciplinary department. However, they managed to catch the protagonist, the guys from the disciplinary department, and the president, upon seeing that the protagonist cannot escape, gets a false sense of victory. Trust in the world, that's what they always said, that there will always be an excuse to kick your ass. However, roles end up reversing as the protagonist ends up holding him by the face and while lifting him with his terrifying hour asks him what's the rush. The main thing is about to start. However, at that moment the security guards end up appearing and clearly were called by him who pointing to the protagonist tells the same thing. The protagonist is a bastard who is beating a man so he asks the guards to detain the protagonist quickly. However, before they could do anything with the protagonist, someone shouts for them to stop. This someone is the local dean, Professor Alberto, immediately. He asks the dean what he is doing there. The dean says the same thing, if he had arrived a little later everything would have gotten out of control. However, thinking that the dean came to defend him, the protagonist shouts at him accusing him of ruining the university's reputation, therefore decided to expel him. However, in the face of his extremely negative influence, it is necessary to send him to detention. However, everything is being the opposite of what the professor had planned since the rest end up beating him when they make the protagonist ask him who is negatively influencing. He asks him who is negatively influencing, saying so who is negatively influencing are they, the teachers who are going against it now are staining the university's reputation, the president tells him that he is wrong, that the culprit is the protagonist and the professor. The professor was there to help him, however, for talking too much, he takes a huge kick from this guy who tells him that his words are inappropriate. But when the professor sees that they beat the president, he approaches the dean to tell him that, that the president is from one of the most important families, and also mentions that the university received a donation from his father for construction. But just like the other guy, they silence him with a tremendous punch to the face, Already on the ground he can only watch as the man offends him, telling him that now he knows much better. He is surprised to see Mr. Foam, who is one of Justin's family's quality readers. Therefore, 
he wonders how he and the protagonist know each other. However, if this was not enough, I guarantee it will be since the dean, when finished speaking, grabs the protagonist by the shoulder and says that the director's bribe will have seriously damaged the university's reputation. Angel the council decided unanimously to dismiss both and dismiss them smiling as he looks at the protagonist he tells everyone that it is good to have such an outstanding student as the protagonist in his university so they must eradicate the more weeds from there. The protagonist decided to expose the president once and for all on the island and what people needed to do was look at the screen. The protagonist presented us with how 40 minutes Ago, the president was organizing his entire plan as part of this plan. No one else was there, he claimed that even if the protagonist was discovered, no one would be able to discover who was really behind it. He considered himself so perfect that the student council of the school would never suspect that he was guilty of anything. People were impressed to discover what kind of person the president was after watching the footage. People turned against the president, throwing tons of garbage at him, saying he should be expelled once and for all since they would not accept someone like him at their university. The president recognized that it was all over and blamed the, blaming the protagonist, desperately lunges towards him with a blank soul, however, the protagonist, in a quick and simple movement, grabs the president's knife and puts his foot so that he falls into the crowd. Seeing him fall in a place where he shouldn't, the protagonist, relevantly, tells him it's time to leave the stage. The audience, with great anger, hates him completely, however, we all know he deserved it. After that, Someone from the audience tells the dean that the student council needs to choose a new president as soon as possible. The protagonist gently suggests that he help justice expel the people who threatened his university, so why not become the student council president? Literally, the Wild West is telling the protagonist he should take the lead. This proposal impressed everyone in the audience, not so much because the protagonist would become president, but because it was recommended by the dean himself. They said it was amazing because the dean reversed the whole situation in one move. As you know, there are ups and downs, some agreed, and others didn't, starting with the protagonist. However, as he approaches the proposal, he thanks the protagonist for everything. If he hadn't been informed and in control, the consequences would have been catastrophic. Despite the proposal not being bad, the protagonist tells the dean that the student council president position should be held by someone competent, capable, excellent. Now the head of the student council's organization department and more, he was expelled by the previous president. Also, as he has experience and skill, in his opinion, he is the perfect person for the student council president position. Being student council president is a very difficult job, and he doesn't want to do it. However, faced with these words, both Lugo and Moore were impressed. Since the protagonist just rejected such an opportunity, of course, he's being the protagonist. What made me admire him a lot. Even though she feels more attracted to the protagonist, another person who was happier than Lou and acted, the protagonist's girlfriend, said that only a man as good as the protagonist, worthy of being her boyfriend. However, as the girl was saying all this, the principal ended up informing that the party must go on. So while the protagonist thought that when everything is over, he will see the lady. After a while, we ended up moving to the bathroom, but I can't tell you if it's the men's or women's bath, but hey, it doesn't matter. Because the important thing is that the protagonist was there to check on the girl. Because remember, the protagonist left her there. However, as the protagonist checks, based on the fact that the powerful sleeping drugs they gave the girls, he says this, we can see how a hand appeared and sprayed some kind of perfume whose smell the protagonist immediately noticed. But when he noticed, it was already too late because the protagonist ended up fainting. While showing us that the protagonist fainted, they also show us that the culprit of all this is the protagonist, who ends up grabbing the protagonist by the jacket, sitting him on the toilet. While she was sitting, scratching her clothes, she said that dress is too much and if in fact we are imagining, probably happens, since the girl wants to make the Riccolino for the protagonist, a mere illusion finds herself fascinated by another character. He completely surrenders, unable to live without this presence. Surprisingly, the protagonist unconsciously ends up helping the girl, lifting her and positioning her to perform some task. Later, he puts her against the wall, while she wonders how he is acting like this since he hasn't woken up yet. She concludes that it's his animal instinct, or maybe it's the protagonist's own instinct. The moment seems confusing for the awakening, who doesn't understand what's going on. As he watches the girl and a bottle next to the protagonist, he deduces that she. He used an aphrodisiac and realized she was cunning, taking advantage of his passive ability still in recovery. As punishment, 
the protagonist approaches her to resolve the situation while saying the same thing that if it weren't for his state of unconsciousness, he would have kicked her but so she'd never do something like that again. The protagonist receives a call and upon answering, the person on the other end says they just saw him boasting about having done something for him in the millionaire's group. The prince believes Jambo was involved. She asks the protagonist why he didn't ask for help in the group. The gentleman had sent a message saying he had a better relationship with the protagonist, something Miss Jambo confirms, also stating she has a good relationship with him. However, the caller asks the protagonist if he remembers the party on the private yacht he mentioned earlier, informing that it will happen tomorrow night in Rio and a very special program. She asks if the protagonist would like to go with them, a proposal he ends up accepting, saying he'll be there, despite being in a bad mood late, but at least he'll have fun on the yacht, which leaves the person on the other end of the call very happy. Hours later, we see these characters toasting. The protagonist's friends are happy because now their companion is the president. However, the new president tells his friends that he needs to go to the bathroom, making the others accompany him. While watching from afar, the protagonist thinks that once his physical attribute has improved, it's not easy to get drunk. After drinking, he's probably a little jealous now. However, while the protagonist thinks this, he notices someone, a girl who is surrounded by bullies who only intimidate her but there's no touching. This makes the bullies laugh at her, saying she likes her spicy style. Pulling her by the arm, one of them says he can't take it anymore and wants her now. However, the girl stops him, saying no way, because she's not that kind of person and they're committing a serious crime. The chubby one beside her tells him to climb his mouth and just encourage them, as he's now responsible for putting out the fire. However, before they could do anything to the girl, the protagonist appears and tells him to leave, as he doesn't want to hurt them. The bullies ask if the protagonist wants to stand out alone, asking if he wants to be a hero to save the beauty. However, the protagonist simply tells them to go away, as he doesn't want to harm anyone. But when they don't understand that and lunge towards the protagonist, it leaves him a little worried. As we know, the protagonist is very skilled, so the bullies take a surprise punch, which obviously surprises them. But the protagonist doesn't give them time. The situation from last night shouldn't affect the operation. The protagonist, upon seeing the miss, felt a mixture of surprise and confusion as she continued to report the details of the operation. He tried to concentrate, but the image of the innocent girl he met before was still fresh in his mind. While the meeting continued, the protagonist tried to hide his distance, but his thoughts kept returning to the girl. He wondered how she was dealing with the situation and if she really deserved to be involved in that dangerous world. So, Miss Sheen, without noticing the protagonist's distraction, continued discussing the details of the operation. She seemed confident that everything was under control and that the plan would be executed smoothly. However, the protagonist couldn't shake the feeling that something was about to go wrong. As the night progressed, the protagonist struggled to focus on the meeting and suppress his concerns. He knew he needed to focus on the task at hand, but the image of the innocent girl still haunted him. He hoped that somehow she would find a way out of that dangerous world, far from all the intrigue and violence he knew were to come. The meeting on the yacht continued, and the protagonist tried to get lost in the details of the operation, but his mind kept returning to the girl. He wondered if there was anything he could do to help her, even though he barely knew her. As the discussions went on around him, he promised himself that he would find a way to protect that lost innocence amid the chaos of the world they were about to plunge into. Happening again, she's almost stunned, yet she remains the protagonist, since he's there again. Before that, the protagonist responds to the girl with a question, and his question like that maybe she changed jobs or say that. Being a waitress is good because she has a better future than her previous job, but the girl simply welcomed the protagonist. I thought that as long as the protagonist didn't interrupt his actions, everything would be fine, however, this man ends up clearly calling the girl, as the girl is on duty. She ends up approaching this man to ask if he wants champagne, something he asks her how she is a waitress on that ship and doesn't know what is Serbian. He tells her, then, the boss who wants to do something different that day, so they would play with him. Also, Boss King is a powerful man and, therefore, he won't treat her normally, playing several money games with Miss Chan. He tells her that they had a lot of fun that day, but they have to have a little more fun, telling him that she is very sexy. Bye. So he did the same, collecting the money and going where she was, saying she had to do a good excellent job with him, words that make the girls go completely silent. But she thinks to herself that if this wasn't for the protagonist, the conversation continued to defend her and told the redhead that she was very sorry. However, they don't offer special services there, 
words that didn't seem to please him much, as he became a little annoyed and called the protagonist a waiter. I asked him how he dared to fight with him, something that made one of the girls next to the redhead stand up and call the protagonist a waiter and a loser, asking if he was a guest. Then she mentioned that he had never been seen before and asked if he was trying to pass himself off as a hero, questioning the protagonist about his invitation. The protagonist replied that he didn't need an invitation, since the captain invited him. They asked why he didn't ask the captain. Hearing all this, they told the protagonist that the ticket for the party cost 100,000 per person, asking if he said the owner of the boat invited him. They asked the protagonist who he thought he was to do this, saying it must be a joke. Others commented that the protagonist was just a poor person who infiltrated the bar, suggesting that he could be a waiter or a thief. They asked why they didn't expel the redhead. He told his colleagues that no matter who the protagonist is, he must kneel and admit his mistakes to the south side, or else he will have his third leg broken. In addition, the waitress must also kneel before him, but in a different way, as they would teach them the game of the rich. However, they regretted the situation, but with the girl thinking to herself that the most important goal is still not movable, so if they close the net now, they will stay here, and even though the protagonist has a little skill, he won't be able to defeat so many people alone. However, while the girl was thinking about this, the protagonist asked the yellow fighter if he is saying that whoever has money can play. If so, the protagonist does the same, agreeing to enter the game. So now the protagonist will call the captain of the ship, words that leave everyone a little puzzled. That said, the protagonist proceeds to call the captain of the ship. However, something unexpected happens when the protagonist calls to answer automatically. She tells the protagonist that the number is wrong when it is available. The protagonist, as these economic resources shouldn't be from an ordinary person. In fact, the protagonist is a VIP guest of the party organizer. However, since the protagonist just bought the entire boat and also gave it as a gift to the girl, everyone at the venue ends up bowing to the protagonist, welcoming them. The captain then tells the antagonist that they are now the new owners of the boat, so the 100 crew members wholeheartedly attend to them. However, this wasn't enough for the protagonist. As they approach the gentleman, he tells him straight to his face that he bought the boat and now the waitress belongs to him. The protagonist asserts that not only does she belong to him, but also the others. When asked for his last name, since he is very young, very handsome, and very rich, the protagonist says they should meet Gordito, who had previously ridiculed him. The protagonist approaches and says it's ridiculous that someone with a last name dare to offend him since he always hated that king. But someone else was also impressed with everything the protagonist had done, she was literally in awe, wondering who the protagonist was and what was happening with Mr. King. We can observe how someone ends up building prisons around themselves. Someone tells Mr. King that he is mistaken, as the protagonist is something more. Mr. King, upon realizing who he is, immediately bows his head and says it's out of place, but the protagonist hits him in the face. Furthermore, he also hits the other guy in the face, saying that if the boss is willing to take it from King, the deal will come to him, and he will give everything to him, literally. That's what the guy hopes, he hopes that the guy who showed up will take care of the protagonist, something that seems he will do. So Mr. King, who is very sincere, ends up accepting, calling the protagonist an old fat sheep, and says he's coming for him, so they have to bite him in the main artery. Therefore, without wasting time, he approaches the protagonist. As he approaches, he tells the protagonist that he is very brave, words that leave the protagonist a little bewildered, but of course, this is normal since the protagonist doesn't even know him. So he goes towards it. He introduces himself to the protagonist as, boss, but people who know him call him, chief. They ask the protagonist for his name, to which the protagonist responds, telling him that, my name is. However, while the protagonist was introducing himself, the miss to whom he was speaking was surprised, as she knew very well who the leader of the Tate gang was. Of course, the girl tells us a little more about the man, saying that he specializes in smuggling from Burma and Laos and managing two underground casinos. In addition, in recent months, her department has raided several of their hideouts successively, so the miss confesses that the goal of the operation that night was honey. However, returning to the same before, he argues to the protagonist that the atmosphere is so good that night, asking him if he wanted to play two games, a proposal that the protagonist ends up rejecting as he tells him that it's not actually legal to gamble. So he'll pass on them, words that end up disappointing him a bit, 
going towards it. The protagonist asks if the man who spends hundreds of millions of dollars has never gambled, thus asking the protagonist if the $800 million have already exhausted all liquidity, that is, he is asking the protagonist if the $800 million were all he had. The girl behind Mr. Lon comments that he was very stingy, as even if the protagonist is ruined, he still owns the bar, asking him how he can say all that. The protagonist, faced with such words from Mr. Lon, comments to him that the money is like that. However, before the protagonist finishes, Mr. Lon interrupts to ask the protagonist where the money is if he doesn't have the guts, words that make the protagonist look at him with. However, sir, as he approaches Mr. Law to tell him that he should forget about this matter because some people have a lot of money but cannot afford to lose, even if asked for 200 million, so based on that, he tells him that he will gamble with, Senorita, you, he will bet and lose 2 billion and return 200 million in cash, thinking that this is much more profitable than giving gifts to the presenters. However, while the protagonist was thinking this, Senorita Shen shaking him asks if he is crazy. Since, as she had said before, she bets against him that he will lose large sums, words that the protagonist does not hear as he continued to think that it would be better for him to lose all his money and go crazy spending all his money. And if by chance you don't know why the protagonist says all this, we remember that the system that the protagonist acquired allows him to spend money but only with a girl, that is, literally the protagonist can spend as much as he wants only if it is for a girl. It must be emphasized that the 80% that the protagonist spends on girls will be transferred to his account. That said, the protagonist immediately sits down to play. However, when the protagonist sits down, the man explains to him that the cow is very complicated and therefore, taking into consideration that the fan may not be able to understand, he is much less participatory and therefore it is the protagonist who they had to play the simplest blackjack game asking the protagonist if she agrees, a thing with which the protagonist ends up agreeing, telling him that he has no problem with them. However, while saying this, the young woman was already starting to say to herself that as a waitress, a rich man will just give her a ship, she definitely cannot refuse a request from a rich man to not expose her identity, she can only play for the protagonist, but while the girl was thinking this to herself, the people behind them were saying that the protagonist was in a terrible situation, asking how could the skills of a waitress in this game be as good as those of the boss. Of course, if that were true, it would be completely ridiculous, since how could a simple waitress have the same stability as a veteran player? But having said that, the game begins and immediately when the game starts, the girl lays the cards on the table, we realize that the protagonist won, which makes the boss tell the protagonist that he is very lucky, asking if he wants to raise the bet, a thing with which the protagonist, as he is not afraid, tells him that the same thing he will bet he will bet as he is. However, in the next round, the protagonist ends up losing things, which makes the man now tell the protagonist that it's okay since he just needs to win the next game. But of course, we know very well that the protagonist doesn't want to win but to lose, and therefore he tells the pink-haired girl that then he will bet now 300 million in the next game, asking why the chip denomination is so small, asking her to bring now 2 billion, which the girl ends up accepting. However, such words from the protagonist leave everyone impressed, literally speechless, while wondering it's like if it were $2 billion and if there's something that the protagonist's money does not have limits, another one that was impressed but happy was the man to whom the protagonist told that as expected from young master LYN, he had a lot of, while thinking to himself that he was really a rich second generation that would make one dizzy, they casually teased him thinking that after winning the $2 billion, his illegal businesses would soon recover. That said, a moment later they don't show how the protagonist continued to bet, however, every time the protagonist, he bet, he lost, and the winner was always the same, Mr. L, who kept winning non-stop. But the protagonist didn't stop because he was losing, as we already know what he wants. So, he kept increasing his money more and more, and the protagonist's amounts reached 200 million, 500 million, and even 1 billion. But of course, the protagonist lost all that money, which is actually good for him, but no one knows that. So, Michin, seeing that the protagonist lost so much money, ends up pulling him aside to talk privately. However, while they watched how Miss Yentz took the protagonist away, they simply thought she was very passionate and certainly wanted to have relations with the protagonist. And when they were alone, Michigan confronts the protagonist, asking if he's crazy, since money isn't wasted like that. She asks the protagonist if he really believes that every time he doubles his money, 
he'll be able to recover what he lost in the past, telling him not to be stupid because there's no such thing as luck at the table. Meanwhile, we can observe how her sympathy decreases by 3%. But the protagonist, upon hearing this, thinks to himself that this is the first time in his short life that he touches a beautiful girl, and that's not bad at all. So, he tells her that it's not her fault and not to get too excited about it, while still thinking it's better to gently persuade her not to scare her, since she can't understand that losing money is an operation to make money. However, the empty words that the protagonist said to Miss Jenny end up making her blush. Thank you very much, protagonist, she says without getting too excited, just wanting to tell him that there's no way she can win this, while thinking to herself that she couldn't control her emotions for a while and the protagonist is almost found out. Upon hearing this, the protagonist smiled calmly, thinking of a new strategy to turn the game in his favor while simultaneously winning Maijin's heart. The story was just beginning to get interesting in his own mouth. He said he couldn't win, he asks the same question, why is it impossible to win if something changes? His cards, recently, of course, becoming the protagonist. He continues asking the same question, if something changes, it's like in the movies where the fruits and the faces of the cards change to whatever you want. Maijin, upon hearing this from the protagonist, lowers her head and tells the protagonist not to be fooled by the movie, as it's the lowest trick there is. So that the protagonist can understand why she said that, she explains to the protagonist that the poker confirmation chip is on the game table and sensors are installed so the table before the cards come out of the dealer the sensor already knows the number and sequence of the cards and it goes towards it knowing which card will be issued and to which person the dealer made it clear before betting and the dealer acts as an intermediary warning through a Bluetooth headset you will know if you should double the bet or give up this round stolen or fake cards will be detected immediately by the sensors since the cards with X and sensors are in complete compliance with the regulations and are designed to prevent players from cheating the only exception is the tip that the dealer receives but this is broad and cannot be discovered after this brief explanation. Miss Shin tells the protagonist that this is why she said he can't win just by asking she asks if he understood to which the protagonist replies yes agreeing with the truth she continues smiling and says it's easy when you know how it works inviting to continue playing and offering him a lesson on the game. The protagonist is a little confused as he doesn't understand what she means. That said, we are introduced to the protagonist who returns to continue playing, however, La Pelagrosa argues that the cards may have been manipulated and decides to check them. The protagonist is confident thinking there's no problem, but they decide to check anyway. After the verification, they make the protagonist lose in a fashion. The people around perceive the situation is getting interesting as the protagonist is betting millions literally while he reviews the cards. The dangerous woman flirts with him. The protagonist suggests that he can examine her wherever he wants, but she suggests he should check the table and his own clothes later. The protagonist soon discovers a flaw in the table and decides to add three levels of strength without explaining immediately why. He says there's no problem and they should continue playing. However, he comments that the boss has won a lot of money but is so cowardly that he only bets tens of millions at a time. He asks if the boss is afraid of losing. People around comment that it's not cheap to play tens of millions, but it depends on who's on the other side. Someone mentions that Senor Link, the protagonist, always bets hundreds of millions, making it really cheap compared to the boss. These words hit the boss like a ton of bricks, and he immediately decides to play a big match with Senor Link. He bets a billion confidently due to his association with the dangerous woman to ensure he'll win. The cards thank the lift, however, when he draws the card, something unexpected happens. And of course, on that note, the protagonist and what he knew was happening. The question is, what's going on, he says to himself, then he hurries because he's in a hurry to return it. However, he's scared, afraid that the sensor won't respond. So the boss is frightened and thinks to himself that he can't believe the protagonist is so lucky. However, we know very well that it's not just luck, it's good to know that the protagonist added these three levels of strength to damage the sensor. And so now the sensor doesn't work, the protagonist has more chances to win, and someone just announced that the boss is still stuck, and the protagonist just won this match. This left everyone surprised at the scene because the protagonist clearly just completely changed the situation. People are commenting that finally, the protagonist had a victory, while others say the protagonist won a game and is back. The chubby guy also says the boss has nothing left in his basket because how could he if he himself bet all his money and therefore lost everything. At this point, he declares that he behaves dishonestly, 
but the protagonist questions the same, asking how he can play, saying that he won many rounds and it's no problem, but now he'll go crazy after losing a game like this. It seems that the one who can't afford to lose is the boss himself, who can't afford to lose. Realizing he can't blame the protagonist, he points to Miss Jean, saying to everyone that this girl just cheated, saying she started playing poker years ago and so can't wrap him up like this. That woman is an expert the protagonist hired, and of course, if her intention was to incriminate the protagonist, I can say she succeeded since everyone was doubting and commenting that they couldn't believe the protagonist had cheated, saying it's not right to cheat. And besides, he says his boat has rules that must be respected at the table, and cheating at the tables is no small matter. Well, it's not a small thing. And besides, he comments that the protagonist has a lot of money but his behavior is dishonest. The next step is this fact that makes Miss Shun defensive. The protagonist tells everyone that he didn't cheat, they can check that the tracking system isn't working. However, he's already tired of the same words, pointing a sharp weapon at the protagonist, telling him that according to the rules of the trade, a cheater cuts his own finger. Furthermore, they confiscate all the betting money, and if the protagonist doesn't do this, it will be one of his bullets or the protagonist in the face of this threat, grabbing a chip on the table and the dice too. But at this moment we hear a gunshot fired, something that clearly worries me. But relax, my friend, it's not the protagonist who's on the ground, but Mr. and Mrs. Chan, who were beside him. She tells herself that she just saw the protagonist take the chips from his right hand, strike the gun, and simultaneously strike Senor Andres several times in a row. The speed of the protagonist was incredibly fast, and of course, that's not normal. Definitely not. Senor King, seeing Mr. Chan on the ground, immediately tells the security guards to quickly arrest the protagonist because he bet thousands of dollars and dared to harm someone. However, the situation reverses, the security guards, instead of catching the protagonist, end up arresting Mr. Chan. This makes him ask why. And of course, as this guy needs an answer, the protagonist approaches to tell him that he forgot something very important. The protagonist is actually the financier of that boat. Now he asks everyone who they think the security guards will listen to, kicking Mr. Chan. The protagonist asks everyone if they think it was he who cheated, surprising everyone when he kicks Mr. Chan, and they see that he had several hidden cards. Sandra, a little curious, asks the protagonist how he won. Smiling, the protagonist approaches her and confesses that while setting up the table, he secretly broke the sensor. It was a game of luck, and he hid two cards up his sleeve when he was winning, words that bring a beautiful smile to Mrs. Face. That's too bad as her popularity rises by 15%. Of course, yes. However, at this moment, Mr. John arrives at the scene and immediately asks what's going on as he sees many people gather. As Senor John is the head of the boat, the chubby one confesses to him that they set a trap for the protagonist and also shot words that make another man be taken away. Yes, it was Mr. John who approaches the protagonist and asks if he's okay. The protagonist replies that he's perfectly fine but he's in a panic and continues to ask if he just took a stray bullet or if he was cut by a knife. However, people hear that the protagonist is Mr. and are surprised since they didn't expect him to be the true master as he was very discreet. While they are surprised, Miss Jean informs someone that the main target has been neutralized and they need to act immediately. That said, back to Mr. John, he confirms to the people that the protagonist is Mr. So he, the protagonist, is the true master who walks, the one who has been speaking. So he especially invites him for this evening, and of course, as expected, people, upon hearing that the protagonist is even Mr., literally start licking his shoes. However, exactly at this precise moment, Several police officers arrive at the scene to inform everyone to remain quiet and still as they would arrest the smugglers. They ask everyone to cooperate, and after saying this, the police act as promised, taking all the smugglers while one officer informs Miss Jan that Mr. sent his men, and the criminals have been captured, ready to be arrested. She accepts the situation and says they should leave now. However, as she is about to leave, she wonders where the protagonist went. He helped capture the criminal, so his money should be returned. While she thinks about it, she realizes that the protagonist is already a bit far away. Fortunately, he takes advantage of the confusion and escapes through the window because he knows that if he is caught by the police, it will be his end. The scene immediately shifts to the girl's room where Jane is. She wonders where the protagonist went and why didn't he respond to your message. She wanted to invite him to dinner at her house the next day, however, 
she is hesitant because last time she invited him something interrupted due to an accident that day. While she ponders about it, the protagonist's ex-girlfriend appears, telling Jane that she looks very tired. Jane asks what's going on because it seems like someone messed with her. The ex-girlfriend advises her to protect herself, and this makes the protagonist's boyfriend confess something to Jane. He says that all of this is the protagonist's fault, revealing that he is not as kind and honest as he seems, he is actually quite rude. Surprisingly, this revelation makes Jane feel incredibly relieved. Hearing this, she asks if he is serious, finding it hard to believe that the protagonist has been rude to her. The ex-girlfriend then reveals that Jane herself tore the dress, indicating a mark that she had, without the protagonist having the strength to turn the lid, the slap mark was clearly visible. Jane is shocked to see the large palm mark and realizes that it wasn't herself who did it, this means that, as the boyfriend had previously said, it was probably the protagonist who assaulted. Realizing that Jane noticed this and that she is trembling, he suggests that she put something on not to catch a cold, however, Jane doesn't say anything and rushes away. It was a satisfaction for the protagonist's ex-girlfriend because she thinks to herself that if she wanted to dedicate herself to the protagonist, it's already too late, since a man will always remain with his first wife. Remembering what the protagonist did to her previously, she says the protagonist is really good, especially when he hit her in the end because it made her feel good. So she wonders when she can continue or when this will happen again. However, she regrets the affair, but here everything continues with Miss Lou, who was outside the boy's dorm. While she walked there, she thought to herself why he wasn't responding to messages or calls. Is he sleeping? She literally referred to the protagonist since, as she said, he doesn't respond to her messages or calls. But that's no longer a problem. She still believes that, based on everything the protagonist's ex-girlfriend told her, it seems they're not lying. But if it's true, she needs to hurry because a rich man like the handsome, muscular, and even girlfriend-less protagonist must be a competition among women. For this reason, she herself, a determined woman, argues that she will never give up. However, while Luya was thinking about it, the people there wondered why that girl was waiting for someone dressed so scantily. They deduced that maybe she had fought with her boyfriend and fled. However, hours passed, the next day, the protagonist, who was out, thought to himself that last night was full of bets and fights and so now he just wants to sleep. However, at that moment, the protagonist notices someone, and that person is Miss Luya, who apparently was waiting for him. It seems she stayed there all night, and indeed, that's what happened. Some people there claimed they saw her waiting there all night while her partner said not only did he see her, but the girl waited there all night, and of course, the protagonist was close enough to hear all this. Despite this, Miss Lou and Vera, the protagonist, immediately throw themselves into his arms to say that he finally came back, something that the protagonist does without wasting time based on what he heard to confirm his theory. He asks the girl if she waited there all night for him, words that Lou confirms, but the protagonist tells her that it's okay, since he himself is so busy that it's fair for her to wait for him. So the protagonist tells her that he wants her to know that he understands what leaves the protagonist a little taken aback. He asks her to understand while hugging the protagonist, she responds to him with a voice. He tells her how tender and sweet she is, how good she perceives him to be, that there must be many better girls than them chasing him, but she, as a woman, is willing to be the most sensible. However, after saying this, Senorita Lu starts to feel a little unwell, and of course, the protagonist becomes a little worried about it, but like every man, he ends up calming the girl down, telling her that he will first take her to rest. After taking her to rest, she thanks the protagonist for bringing her back and provocatively taking the protagonist's hand, she tells him that he is too good to her and therefore proposes to the protagonist that as he was too focused last night, he is probably tired. She asks him to let her massage him, words that make the protagonist blush, thinking that Luya waited for him all night, but still she wanted to give him a massage, and the protagonist praises her for it. Therefore, he thinks that Luya is a truly extraordinary girl, and just like the protagonist, he is not foolish to reject this proposal, he ends up accepting it since there is no need to waste the opportunity that has come his way. He asks Louis if she knows how to massage, and then positioning herself over the protagonist, she replies that of course she does, asking him to relax and rest, the protagonist ends up doing so, and while he was relaxed, he tells her that it is very comfortable. As a gesture of gratitude, he tells her that since her house is a bit far from school, 
he will take her to buy a house near the school in a few days, which ends up moving the girl by the protagonist's beautiful gesture towards her. He ends up giving her a kiss on the cheek while the system also informs the protagonist that her favorability has increased by over 4%, resulting in a total favorability of 95 for Lou and him. However, we know that the protagonist is only giving her this gift to seize the opportunity to make money. Nevertheless, things were already getting exciting, and while Louis was putting her hand where she shouldn't, she argues that from now on, she will give him a massage every day, asking if he agrees to it, words that the protagonist affirms yes, of course, who would be foolish enough to refuse such a proposal. But the most intriguing thing of all is that they don't tell us what happened after that since some voices were simply heard in the background. However, they show us how the protagonist had fallen asleep after the massage. So when she realizes that the protagonist had fallen asleep, she immediately picks up the phone to ask the protagonist's ex-boyfriend what she should do, since the protagonist has just said that he will buy a house for her. Previously, the protagonist spent over 10 million to buy a house for her, but now she wants to buy a house for him, asking if she should accept or not as she is very distressed. However, the protagonist's ex-girlfriend is very surprised when she realizes that Lyndon is going to buy a house for Luya. But she pretends that these words don't affect her at all, writing to her saying that if the protagonist gave it to her, then she should accept since anyway, the protagonist has so much money that he doesn't have time to spend it, so he buys pets and donates to beggars, and besides, she argues that she doesn't even care about the protagonist's money. But then, in response to this, she simply comments to herself that she has only been with Lyndon for a few days, and he has spent so much money on her, which is embarrassing, and she thinks she has never heard that Miss Lou literally spent money on her and was bragging. But the protagonist's boyfriend still tells her that money is something common and means nothing to her, and what matters is the physical and mental union between her and the protagonist, but this makes her laugh a little as she thinks to herself that she is just kidding since when the protagonist gives her a new house, she will take a selfie with him on the big couch and send it to her, and of course, that will. The purpose of this photo is to keep it with your impotence and your anger, said that time passes, and in the afternoon, we spend with the protagonist who said that after the morning massage it was good to take a nap. However, when the protagonist picked up the phone to check the messages, he was surprised because there were many messages, and besides, the day before Luya asked the protagonist where he was because she wanted to tell him something, but not only her, also Miss Shen, the new protagonist, told her that she was still in pain in the waist but she felt very well asking when they could have dinner and besides them also Miss Yembo, Miss Yuan, and even Miss Shen, Miss Shashi invited the protagonist. Literally, all of them wanted to go out with the protagonist. The protagonist also tells us that the son in person sent messages to the girls but they did not respond but now, on the contrary, and as there are many counterattacks and also as the girls are a hard task for the protagonist, he even wonders how he can have so much time to talk to all of them. But as the protagonist continued reading the messages, he himself notes an important message from the car sellers who told the protagonist that the car he had ordered had already arrived asking when it will be delivered which the protagonist upon seeing this message thinks to himself even though lately he has forgotten many things to do so he completely forgot about it but still not he saved enough for the car but as the protagonist is interested in the car he wrote the same thing for him that he will personally pick up the car and said that the protagonist tells himself that he has nothing to do that afternoon so he had to see with his own eyes and the car is as beautiful as in the photo however after that time passes we went to the car exhibition convention and and there were many people there and besides people there were many cars per sports car the protagonist who was arriving at the location is impressed with the great car exhibition impressed he thinks to himself that the owner of the car is a real thief because he said to him that he would pick up his car personally showed him how merchandise and besides that there are many luxury cars with no name therefore the protagonist confesses to us that this is his first time at a car show but the protagonist is also surprised by something else and the thing is that there are many foreigners at the location however when one of these foreigners asks if the lord is there he ends up appearing next to Miss Shen Welshen. Menu along with also the one in blue jacket whose name is Yuck and of course this good gentleman for senior center let's call him CJ said Yuku and Miss Mi Jun approaches him to ask if he is thirsty because she will bring water for him words that she ends up denying him because she tells him that she is not thirsty but in this way of insistence she also asks if he is hungry because she will bring a sandwich for him and also the girl. 
Before that I ended up rejecting because she tells him that she is not hungry either however someone who does not reject opportunities is the protagonist because when he sees that there is water nearby he ends up calling so that he can take a sip but of course he did but while he was drinking the protagonist thought to himself that all this is great since not he expected that the car show would have food and drinks. And besides he could see that there was also free ice cream this is ice cream it seems they had an alkene dessert well I don't know what that is. But none of this the protagonist upon seeing this immediately approaches the girls to ask for ice cream but they tell the protagonist that they are very sorry because they ran out of ice cream but of course at first glance this can be seen as if they were denying the ice cream to him but the protagonist as he has no idea of this says that then he will leave however when the protagonist is leaving at that moment some foreigners arrive to ask the girls if there is more ice cream and the redo with correct punctuation and accentuation. Girls, in response to that, tell him that there is. While they were passing one to him, they say that the spoon is on the lid and that he should use it slowly. But of course, the protagonist manages to notice this, and people turn out well. What kind of people were those girls? But this was not done only to the protagonist, as we can see how other girls end up arriving at the place to ask if there is more ice cream, to which the girls, like they said to the protagonist, say that there is none. But when the girls were planning to leave the place, the protagonist ends up appearing to confront them and tell them that it is not for him or for them. Those girls did not have ice cream but for the foreigner who had just entered, they had asked, so if their ice cream depends on race. The red-haired girl who had been informed earlier that there was no ice cream asks if this is true, and when her friend sees some people with ice cream, she tells her that she just needed to look since those two foreigners have ice cream. And of course, facing this, they do not avoid asking themselves what is happening. Exactly the girls facing this with dead mosquito apologize, telling her the same thing, that this is a daily limit available only to certain customers, which leaves the protagonist annoyed. To hear this, he asked the same as certain customers, telling her that it refers to different people than the Chinese words, which leaves her a little angry. But if these simple words made her angry, I think this will make her more irritated. Since the protagonist ends up making a scene because of the ice cream, and they do not give him one of what the girls like had told the protagonist before, they tell him that they are sorry but that was the last one. But the protagonist does not believe it and asks them to open the box since he needs to see with his own eyes. However, this confusion is happening, the gentleman asks you who is making so much noise in his exhibition area, what kind of thing is this? Mr. Han tells him that it's just a few Chinese people causing trouble and so he'll just go there to resolve it, and having said that, he asks Senorita and Oyen if she's also worried that her brother's business will be affected by this telling her not to worry since he's there. But those words said by him seem not to please the girl very much, and she tells herself that this guy Yukon is upset. If it weren't for the fact that her brother has a cooperative relationship, she really wouldn't want to talk to him. However, having already said that, Yuku approaches the protagonist and asks him the same person, what he's talking about, what thing is this? The protagonist answers him, asking if he is responsible, and if so, tells him that those two waitresses only give ice cream to foreigners, but people from their own country cannot eat. What arrogantly approaching the protagonist and asking what is the problem since foreigners have money, but maybe he has told him that a person who goes to car shows to eat and drink still has the nerve to cause problems there. Literally, this man is treating the protagonist like a poor idiot, but we know it's not like that. Having said that, the protagonist tells himself that he's sorry to disappoint him, but he's there to get a car. What thing for those are dying of laughter? But the protagonist then asks him the same thing, what's funny? And the CU mocking the protagonist tells him that no matter how poor he is, he can't get a car, asking if he wants to get a car for 6,000 and still tells the protagonist that there's no need for them to tell a lie since there's no car worth less than $1 million at the Yanin car show, asking him then if he understood. However, Based on the noise they were causing in the place, several people ended up approaching him to ask what's going on. Why is there so much noise there, something that someone ends up arguing that the protagonist is a moocher and went there just to eat and drink and still makes a scene. And of course, in response to that, people ask why they didn't take him out of there, however, Yuck asks the protagonist who is still there, saying he really has tough skin. However, the protagonist, while savoring something, tells him something he finally found, and what he found was something Senor Jean had given him as a gift the other day. And when he shows what Senor Jean had given him the other day, the protagonist immediately leaves everyone speechless, 
making people wonder who he married. This is one of the only five diamond VIP cards for the car salon, and to be able to get one of them, you have to spend over 10 million interactive dollars, at least 1 billion to get a diamond VIP card. However, since the protagonist now has literal power in his hands, he asks if they could finally shut up and listen when people realize who the important character the protagonist is, they apologize to him, saying they made a big mistake, which makes the protagonist ask the same person how they made a mistake, telling her that not only him, they have to apologize, but also all the Chinese in that show since anyway everything started with her pleasing foreigners. And besides, it doesn't matter whether she has money to buy a car or not, the red-haired girl also says that ice cream is just a little thing, asking her if she thinks the only thing that matters to her is that little piece of ice cream, telling her so what matters to her is that she has been on her knees for a long time to learn to stand up in a few words. She doesn't learn from her mistakes. When people hear all this about the red movie, they end up praising it because it is very well said and therefore say that the girl is great, but she is not. The girl is amazing, our protagonist congratulates the girl saying she's so beautiful she deserves a thumbs up, meanwhile a man in the distance complains about the situation. But suddenly at this moment, Junjun arrives to hug Lin Chin. Disconcerted, Lin Chin asks who she is. She responds to Linen's brother asking why he didn't warn her when she arrived, Definitely he is an important guest and needs to be in position without a cut belt later our protagonist shouts again then Junjun says that he forgot to introduce himself, his name is Cha Men, a brother of Mr. Yu. She says she heard a lot about him from the brothers and confesses that she didn't expect Mr. Yu to have such a beautiful sister. The idiot is surprised, now he has Junjun's full attention asking who the hell is this guy who came out of nowhere to steal her. The girl says to see with that these two are from your car sales company. Steven says he already knows he doesn't need to be told how to handle this. He thinks he's in trouble and didn't expect such a commotion to affect his sales. He can only do one thing and starts yelling that these two people are temporary workers. He is very angry because they did such a thing. Steven's car company is firing these two people immediately to show a good attitude. People People around comment that this is better and that it is doubtful what these two did. The employees try to defend themselves telling manager Chu that it's not their fault but he yells at them to shut up. However, Junjun said to wait for the moment that it's just a firing and it can't be that easy. The employee a little nervous asks what Junjun wants. He tells Linen's brother if he wants him to ask the security guards to beat her up for revenge but our protagonist all calm responds that they shouldn't worry about them. Yanin tells the employees that they are lucky that Mr. Kian is so generous that he will let them go yelling for them to get lost. They bow hesitantly thanking and run out onto the street but one of them trips causing laughter from the audience. However, regretting the case Case. this is how we end this video. But bro, don't be sad about the end of the video, but be happy about what happened. But if you liked it, leave your like, if you want the continuation, leave your comment below and remember, it's very good that the lazy soul wants everything but nothing. Reaches.